Born in 1950, Wyman was raised on the 27,000-acre Lee Ranch as a cowboy and consummate outdoorsman in Knox County of the West Texas Rolling Plains. Minzer graduated from Texas Tech in 1974 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Wildlife Management. He was voted outstanding alumni in 1987 by the Department of Range and Wildlife Management at Texas Tech University in recognition for his contribution to wildlife management through writing and photography. He also received the Distinguished Alumnus Award in 1995 from the School of Agriculture Sciences and Natural Resources in recognition for professional achievement and contribution to society. In August of 1999, Minzer was honored to give the graduation commencement address at his alma mater. He was asked to become an adjunct instructor in college of mass communications in 2000, teaching for a period of 12 years. During his tenure as instructor of senior and graduate level students, he was elected mass communications teacher of the year in 2005. From 2000 to 2002, Wyman served on the range Wildlife and Fisheries Management Advisory Board at Tech. In 2009, he received the Distinguished Alumnus Award from Texas Tech Alumni Association in recognition of outstanding achievement and dedicated service. Post-graduation, Wyman spent five years as a professional predator hunter on the big ranches of the Rolling Plains, living out of a half dugout on the Pitchfork Ranch. During this period, he worked to perfect his photographic skills, and now, after 45 years as a professional photographer, Wyman has photographed and or collaborated on 30 large format books, and his images have appeared on more than 250 magazine covers throughout America. And in 1985, Sports of Field magazine featured Wyman as one of five new breed photographers in America. His images have appeared in Smithsonian, National Geographic Books, Natural History, Ebony, Time, Newsweek, U.S. News, and World Report. Sports of Field, Field and Stream, Outdoor Life, Texas Parks and Wildlife, Texas Highway, Korea GEO, German GEO, Das Tier, Arion, Horzu, BBC Wildlife, and a host of others. His writing endeavors have also appeared in dozens of magazines, including the Smithsonian Magazine, Outdoor Photographer Magazine, Sports Afield, Texas Parks and Wildlife Magazine, Texas Highways, Texas Wildlife Association Magazine, Peterson's Hunting Magazine, Korea Geo, Field and Stream, and many others. Honors include Official State Photographer of Texas by the 1997 75th Texas State Legislature, the John Ben Shepard Jr. Award from the Texas State Historical Foundation for contributing to the preservation of Texas history, through Writing and Photography, 1997 National Literary Award for the book Texas Lost, Vanishing Heritage, with the author Andrew Sansom, and the San Antonio Conservation Award for the natural history book Roadrunner. In 2000, Wyman received the Charlie McTee Outdoor Media Award from the Texas Wildlife Association. In 2003, Wyman and author, the late John Graves, was awarded the Star of Texas Award from the Gillespie County Historical Society for their collaborative work, Texas Hill Country. In 2011, Wyman was inducted into the Texas Heroes Hall of Honor by the Frontier Times Museum in Bandera, Texas, and also received the A.C. Green Literary Award, presented to a distinguished Texas author for the Lifetime Achievement. Minzer received the 2018 Harvey Wheel Living Legacy Conservation Award for his art, which inspires others to engage in conservation efforts. The Harvey Wheel Foundation has given this award only three times previously. Field and Stream Magazine named Wyman one of America's outdoor legends in 2018. Also, Minzer's work hangs in perpetuity at the George W. Bush Presidential Library on the SMU campus and in the Ross Perot Museum. Minzer is a self-taught photographer and historian who lives in Benjamin with his wife, Celinda. Along with his photography, Minzer enjoys work with wood, hunting with rifles, pistols, and bow. He is a licensed single-engine pilot and commercial drone operator, using both in his photography endeavors. In 2019, Wyman and his wife, Celinda, became agents under the Chass Middleton Ranch real estate brokerage firm in Lubbock, Texas. 
David Baxter, former editor of Texas Parks and Wildlife Magazine, described Menzer best when he called him a man with the eye of a 19th century impressionist painter and the soul of a buffalo hunter. Hope you guys enjoy it. Okay, I got, I got everybody muted out, so I'm going to do a little bit of an intro real quick, and then we'll just kind of go right into it. I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to, at the very beginning, without using all the info I'm going to, or all of the memory, I'm going to read your whole Vita. Not right now, but before. Okay, here we go. What's up, guys? You're here with O'Neill Ops, and this is the Predator Hunter Podcast. This is a place where we break it down, where we go into detail with the equipment that we use. And today we have a special guest. We have Wyman Minzer in-house. Just went to the airport this morning a couple hours ago and picked him and his son, Hunter, up and... uh this is going to be a good one. Most of our podcasts are, I would say, somewhat entertaining, and this one's going to be entertaining for you guys, but hopefully a lot more informational. So with that said, I'm just going to uh, let Wyman introduce himself, and he's done this a lot of times. He's done numerous books, numerous interviews. It'll be kind of a walk in the park, but I, the only problem that I'm going to have is there's going to be so much information to, to try to get from him to get it done within, you know, a two and a half hour time frame that I'm going to try to hit for the goal. So Wyman, introduce yourself and tell us, just tell us about yourself and, and in breaking the ice, how you got into the, the predator hunting side of things. Yeah, James, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you for having me. Um, I was raised on a ranch in, uh, in the North Central Texas area, Knox County, which is about 125 miles east of Lubbock and about 80 miles west of Wichita Falls, which is kind of known to a lot of people as a big empty because it's just all big ranch countries. Not a lot of people live there. You know, you've got 500,000 acre ranches, 200,000 acre ranches. So uh, a lot of opportunities to, to be a field as a kid. And even being raised on a ranch, I mean, I did ranch work, but my main interest was in hunting. And so, um, uh, if I had any extra time at all, I was out, you know, when I was old enough to shoot a twenty two, I was out setting traps and shooting twenty twos. And then when I was uh, 14 years old, I became interested in, in coyotes and the habits of coyotes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, of course, that was in 1965 and uh, didn't have much money to expend at the time. And I bought a old thirty thirty Marlin, which is a terrible coyote rifle. But um, uh, then I had a, a girlfriend who whose daddy made coyote calls out of a boat arc. And so I talked her into stealing one of her dad's calls for me. What's boat arc? <laughs> it's Osage Orange. It's a brush. It's a type of a wood, a very beautiful, very hard wood. Um, uh, in Oklahoma, there's a lot of boat arc. And so, um, and so anyway, I, uh, blew on that call a while. And then one, uh, it was on, uh, it was the, let's see, September, uh, October the 17th, 1965, the Baptist preacher's son and I were out calling one afternoon and, uh, I had my old 30, 30, I had two rounds left cause I decided in and uh, he had a 22 Magnum, an old Western field, 22 Magnum. I had him looking South and I was looking North. And I showered down on that call, and I'm sure it sounded like hell. And all of a sudden, there were two coyotes, but they were running like hell. So probably running uh, away from me. 
and I jumped up, and son of a gun, if I didn't shoot one of those things at 247 yards running. In fact, I put uh, stones on the blood spot that's still there today. And that's I went. Pretty cool. I, yeah, took, I took a, a range finder back to that spot, thinking surely I missed it. I, I misstepped it. It's exactly 247 yards. Wow! Shot him right behind the right ear and come out under his left eye. That'd be really <laughs> cool and uh, not too hard to plug into a ballistics calculator and figure out what your lead would be. Uh, if I had yeah. a two you know and what a half, I, mean? I had a two and a half power Sears and Roebuck scope on it. Yeah. And uh and that that just totally I mean it charged my battery. So that's what that's what kind of triggered you like this that is going to be fun. Really that was triggered it. me. I was I was I was really hung up thin on it. And how how old did you say you were about? I was uh, 14. 14. Yeah. So and that that's what that's what that was the 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 trigger. That was the ignition right there. Gotcha. Yeah. From then on uh th- this is the thing that that <clears throat> The thing that I really so I was I, I was really honestly introduced to you because I mean nothing against it, but I I, I didn't know who you were right, until right. some fella on Instagram. What I was trying to do is get more information regarding coyotes biology, biological mm-hmm. studies. Mm-hmm. And a, a fella's like, hey, you need to you need to reach out to this guy because mm-hmm. he's been there, he's done that. And that was my my kind of a, a initial reasoning for contacting you. And then I got to you and I talked and we just hit it off. You yeah. know, we talked for gosh dang, an hour or longer. Right. And I'm like, your your mindset, your concepts, your uh the way that your outlook is regarding predator hunting, it, it, the values of it are right in line with mine. Right. Not just because I I can relate to the the photography side of things, how you've done it, mm-hmm. but just the way that you approach it mm-hmm. and that how you look at it. And that was really a lot more uh uh, intriguing to me, a lot more interesting. So you got into it about 14 and it it turned into not just necessarily you going out and doing it for fun. You kind of did it for a living. I did. Uh, actually, when I started to Texas Tech in 1969, I was uh, studying wildlife biology and I, for some reason, thought that I ought to write a book on on calling. And I started, and I still have the, the ten pages I wrote. So, and what what was your age about that time? Were you thinking I was a uh, nineteen? Okay, wow. And so, uh, and I quickly after ten pages realized that I needed more experience. So, fifty what fifty seven years later, I finished the book. Oh, okay. <laughs> and that would have been your that would have been your. Well, you've got a couple books. Well, I've done thirty books. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, I, I had no idea. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so yeah, keep going. But anyway, um, but that that was the initial. That's that's whenever the idea for doing a book was was planted. That's when the seed was planted to do a book, and I never really forgot uh, the goal. And so I knew that in order to do that, I needed to take notes. I didn't need to say, okay, you know, I'm just going to go out and shoot a coyote. So I started really uh, writing down information on you know weather conditions and distances if I was going to shoot them, uh, and I and and uh, gender if I if I took one if I harvested one to gender its age uh, because when I were I uh, was a, like a junior at Tech I actually received a grant to study the uh, food habits of coyotes on the rolling plains of Texas, and for uh, a year. I was paid by the university to hunt and to eviscerate coyotes. And, um, and so, um, I, uh, would, uh, uh, I kind of forgot where I was going with this one. Uh, anyway, well, anyway, it was the, the notes, you know, once you, once you start them, it's like, I didn't, I, I knew that I could not stop. It was like, there was a, a pattern that I wanted to set. I wanted to, if there was, if I did it for 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40, 50, I wanted to be able to recognize patterns. And so, in uh, in 1969, basically it began taking the notes in sincerity, and then I've kept up these notes. And it's really funny because I have seen pattern changes over 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 five decades of of this of hunting. And I, that's that's something that I would like to talk about yeah. too along with everything else because 
um, I, I it, it's you 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 see patterns throughout. You know, I'm we're 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 all here about Keith's forty, John's you know thirty, I'm forty. Uh, you see the weather patterns change. You see different things change, and you also see a- animals change as well. Mm-hmm. You know what they're doing throughout different kinds of of, of you know whether it's the atmosphere, or different wet seasons, right? Whatever they they have to change, mm-hmm. otherwise they're not going to live. But uh, I had a hunter here probably six seven years ago, probably close to your age, and that's exactly what he did. His he he his uh. His ultimate uh, joy in life was applying for tags, for whatever tags, anywhere in, mm-hmm. in the world. That's what he loved doing. In the off-season when we were out hunting, he was on the computer applying for whether it was bighorn sheep, whether it was right. elk in Arizona, so, something. And every hunt that he went on, even when he was here and he had an elk tag, he was mm-hmm. sitting over in a water hole on a pivot. He had a journal, and I, he, he walked in with that journal. I'm like, well, do you mind me asking you what that is? And he's did maybe not elaborate as you but he wrote mm-hmm. down whatever the day was like what the temperature what the mm-hmm. wind was doing what the barometric pressure was doing what he was seeing move right and that to me i'm like that's just genius because that's history mm-hmm. that it that's is. the only way that you're gonna be mm-hmm. able to follow some sort of trend about the animal absolutely by studying so that's why yeah. we really appreciate that that's yeah. i would like to anything that you can elaborate on that it would be huge sure. As, as much as anything, I've seen that uh, that coyotes have gotten heavier in Texas, at least in the rolling plains. And in 1973 to 74, like a male would average about 24 pounds. And um, I don't know if it's last year, year before last, they averaged like 31. What do you, what do you, what do you think? Wild that- hogs. Okay. okay. There you go. Sense. Heck yeah. Wild hogs. Yeah. You've got guys with choppers and they're killing wild hogs. In fact, my younger son, uh, he has a hunting service from, from January till June hunting hogs, not the chopper but with dogs. And they kill hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And most of these guys do not take the meat. Right. And well, even if just, you wanted to, that that's too much. Right. You couldn't. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you and they've got the intestines there that the coyotes can eat yeah, if they yeah. take the meat. And so these coyotes just, I mean, they just devour these dead hogs. And they kill some of the some of the young piglets. I've seen them trotting across the pasture with a piglet in their mouth. And so uh, that and also, also a trend is that in the 70s, um, most of the ranchers utilized just cow-calf operations. That was it. And then in the late 70s, 80s, and 90s, they began doing uh, yearling operations. It'd be uh, just like bringing in 10,000 yearlings. And if you had like a 2% death loss, yeah, you've got a lot of beef. Yep. Sure. Yeah, big time. A lot of beef out there. And I think that's attributable also to to the increase in average weights. So but, you uh, think that, I mean, you, so what you're saying is, the without getting too crazy down it, the, the weight of the coyote isn't just from having a full stomach no no I, like i killed uh, i called one up uh two what was it two years ago in uh, august i believe and he weighed 44 pounds wow no no 46 46 pounds i carry scales with me everywhere i go yeah and i thought surely he's got a jackrabbit in him i eviscerated him he had a handful of mesquite beans and that was it and he was that big, that, that big, big of a frame. So he yes. had to be, it was all muscle and skeletal. Yep. Yeah. Yep. What? So when you're doing your notes, that journal goes with you all the time on yep. every set that you make. Mm-hmm. The, hey, the, okay, let's keep going from early on. So from, from, from your and my previous conversations, you went from essentially being a killer mm-hmm. to being a viewer. Yep. Yep. And that's, I, I respect that. Yep. That's, you know, I, I, right now I'm in the stage of doing both. Yeah. You know, we're doing, we're filming, we're taking pictures, we're right. killing. Uh, let's, let's just kind of go through that process from you doing your studies early on, you're, mm-hmm. you're, you're trapping, mm-hmm. and then up through <clears throat> the transition to you go, hey, I want to bring a camera along. I yeah. want to, I want to, I want to try it from a different angle. Yeah. Well, you know, in the 80s, uh, I, okay. My degrees in wildlife biology, and I never really had any formal training in photography. 
but when I was doing, when I was engaged in my research, my professor loaned me a camera. And so he said, you need to take some data shots, you know, some pictures of uh, coyotes and traps, you know, that you're fixing to ear tag and release and that type of thing. And I, and I thought, wow, I like this. And so when I graduated from tech, well, I started, I bought me a camera and started, started shooting images and then decided that I wanted to be a photographer, a professional photographer. So I started sub- to submitting to magazines. And, uh, and in 1979, I believe, I believe it was 79 or 78, 79, I got my first publications in National Wildlife and in Texas Parks and Wildlife. And then after that, I started shooting for field and stream, outdoor life, and, and uh, sports field. And uh, during the 80s... It says here, I, I just did a screenshot this morning, you've had more, this is Wikipedia, I don't know how long it was, more than 250 magazine cover photos published. Yes, yeah. Is that, is that, yeah. that's about accurate right yeah. there, probably mm-hmm. more than that. Mm-hmm. But, wow. wow. But that's all I did. And then in the, in the, when I wasn't shooting pictures, you know, going to Alaska or to uh, Yukon or something, shooting stone sheep hunts, or white-tailed deer in South Texas, I was calling up coyotes and trying to get pictures of them. But still, in the, in the 80s, I was in my 30s, and I did more shooting with a rifle. But as time went on, I just started uh, transitioning over to mostly to photography. So if I call up 200, 250 coyotes in the winter, I might shoot 30 of them with a rifle. The rest of them I'll do uh, photography. Okay. And when did you say that, that that full transition took place? How old were you when you when you almost well you never fully gave up the rifle? No, but no. Where no. were you where you started shooting more with the shutter versus the rifle? What what when did that transition? How old were you? 40, 50? Uh, probably in the fifties. Okay. Where yeah. you were actually taking more pictures yeah. than you were doing killing. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. And then yes. you're so you you wanted to you you knew you wanted to be a professional or you you that's what you're you're like this is fun I want to do this yep since then rattle off some of your accomplishments that you've gotten regarding your photography side of things like where whether it's like I just said 250 magazine right, covers right. that's crazy yeah, I used to shoot a lot of okay in 1980 what was it 1985. I was named one of the five photographers in America called the New Breed by Sports and Field magazine that we shot differently than other people. And and I was always considered a cover shooter. I remember one photographer from Montana coming through <clears throat> one time. Excuse me. I'm getting yep, a little yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he's, it- pa- he's passed now, bless his heart. Is and, uh, before you talk about that guy, don't lose mm-hmm. it. Is a cover shooter <clears throat> basically like a high? You you kept you you get more high value photography yes. for high high value images. They called us big uh, big shooters. The Montana guy come through and he he did a lot of publishing, but he said, you know, <clears throat> you what you, you and about five or six other guys in America are what what we others consider as big shooters. We shot covers, okay, because they paid more. I got you. You know, yep, <laughs> and, yep. And it and it puts you out into the public more. I mean, in in for those who read the magazine, other photographers are like, this guy got another cover. You know, this guy got knocked another one off field and stream, sports of field, outdoor life, and it's just kind of one of those deals, you know, where you become more well known and get your reputation built up. Yep, yep, I got you. So the fellow that you were talking about that passed away. Mm-hmm. What was what was going on with that? With you, you were talking about yeah, with him passing away. Yeah, he what 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 did he do? What was his? He was a photographer. He lived in Montana. Um, uh, golly, I hadn't thought of him in a while, but um, mm. he he was just he the was, one. He, of the, was he, good, was, he was a good. He was a good photographer. Very, he was another <clears throat> cover shooter. Very no no no. He wasn't. He was not. He did mostly uh, illustrative <laughs> shots inside on stories. Oh, okay, but he was very good and very prolific. And um, a, a really a nice guy, but he would come through Texas sometime and, and stay at my house for two or three days, and we'd go out and shoot some pictures. Gotcha. Yeah. And it, so at the time, was it, was it I mean, would you consider that a, a doable job with what oh, you were it, it was. It, I mean, that's all I did for, golly, 
And what I mean doable, I don't mean you're not capable. I mean, was it was the 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 money that you would make worth mm -hmm. it? It, oh, yeah. it was good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it progressed from there. Yeah, and I, you know, and I got tired like in 1989 or so. I was, it was like almost overnight. He was like, you know, I'm tired of shooting for magazines. I'm going to start doing books because I had been uh, documenting roadrunner behavior for like 17 years. And a friend of mine who I graduated with from Tech, who's a who became a PhD, he said, you know, you ought to do a book on on the uh, uh, natural history of roadrunners. I said, you know, that's a pretty good idea. And I did, and it that book, no, I mean, knocked the top out. I don't know. It's in sixth printing, seventh printing. I don't know. Wow. But it went all over the world. Um, it it created interest in Germany, Dostier magazine, Hortsu, uh, Korea Geo, in Italy, in France, because they had all seen the Roadrunner cartoon, Beep Beep. Uh -huh. Yep. I couldn't read that's, German. I couldn't read French, but I could see beep beep, yep. and I knew that that's that's what created the interest. So that's what it, I was just going to ask you what it was. That's what it was. Yeah. And so that that book really, and Smithsonian Magazine ran a big ten page spread on it, and so it, it turned out to be a big deal. And that was your book. Yeah, yeah. I wrote and photographed it. Yeah. Wow, wow. That's really neat. I had no idea on that. Yeah. And some of the. I will. I have, for the intro, your Vita, your bio is pretty, I mean, pretty elaborate mm -hmm. with everything that you've mm -hmm. accomplished throughout your life regarding this, you know, this aspect. Uh, you've been, what? so President Bush mm -hmm. named you, appointed you. Yeah, state photographer of Texas. Actually, the 75th legislature, and he signed it off. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um I didn't even know it was going to happen. All of a sudden, I just get a call. I'm I'm up in a panhandle or somewhere, and I get this call and said, uh, can you be in Austin? Like, And this is on a Friday. He said, can you be in Austin on Monday? And I said, well, yeah, I guess so. But why? He said, well, you've been designated the state photographer of Texas by the 75th legislature. And so uh, I ended up in Austin and changed out of my Levi's into a suit in my car out in the parking lot <laughs> and walked in. And went down on the on the legislative floor with the uh, the speaker of the house, Pete Laney, and stood up there while he whacked around on that with his hammer, you know, his gavel, and they read it off. And then I went to another room, and then uh, then Governor Bush came out and signed it, and we visited it. So the the uh, you had no idea. No, you just re literally you have no idea yeah. that that was going to happen. Yeah. How did it happen? Uh, some. Representatives and senators got together. They saw what you did. Yeah, they, yeah, yep, and yeah. they just said, "Hey, this guy yeah. needs to got gotcha. you. Yeah, needs to be recognized for what he's doing." Yeah. And point, yeah, yeah, it's it a, it a really cool thing, and I really appreciate them doing it. That's cool. Yeah, that's really neat. And it's not, you know, I've had people say, "Oh, you know, I, what do you do for the state?" I said, "It's just a name. It's just yeah, a title." I was going to say, "Does that consist? It's what just a what title. did that consist? Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's it's a big deal. It is." Yeah. Oh hell yeah! Yeah, it's a big imagine deal. that Texas yeah. is a freaking huge, and being able yeah. just to have that, you're. I mean, that's yeah, forever. Yeah, I mean, you're. Yeah. It'll. That's what's real, like a legacy. Mm -hmm. That's cool. It is. That's it's awesome. a legacy. Yeah. So, when you, when I asked you about, uh, kind of doing this for a living, mm -hmm. early on. Would you consider yourself more of when you were doing it early on when you first started more of a were you were you a more of a seasonal hunter regarding hunt, hunting coyotes no. and using them or were you no. more of an all around I hunted summer, spring, fall and winter. Okay. And then I realized, you know what? It's not fair to go out and kill a coyote that's that has pups. It's just, it's not right. Yep. And so I would just stop hunting, say, the 1st of April, and I would not start back until the pups had left the dens and gone out on their own. Would you still go out and then just shoot with your camera then? Or oh, yeah. Just, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but coyotes are not, are not, don't make good subjects in the summer. They're so right. ugly. Yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. So did you, was there a time 
there was a time in your life where you actually used and sold fur. You trapped. Yeah. You you go yeah. go through, go through a little bit of that when you what you like the whole process yeah. of because that's that's something that a lot of people don't understand. That's a lot of work. Yeah. In '73, uh, when I was a, a junior at Tech, I had heard that uh, that fur prices were up, and I I mean that was like something that I thought died in the '30s. And so I had a, a professor there that uh, actually I co-authored a paper with. Um, told me he's from Utah, and he said, "Hey man, I know a fur buyer up in Utah that you ought to send a fur to." So I went out and shot a coyote, sent it to this fur buyer, and I got fifteen bucks. And I went, "Holy Moses!" Was it you know? just just a random coyote, or was yeah, it a pretty a, good coyote? A, no, just a pup. You know, just a say a six month old, eight month Nothing old. Nothing special about no. it. 15 bucks, and I thought, you know, 15 bucks, 1973 was 15 bucks. Yeah. And for, especially for a college student. Yeah. And so I thought, hey, man, my days of working cattle are over. <laughs> That's This is it, what I'm going to do. And so come Thanksgiving, when I run trap line, Christmas, I ran trap line. And uh, I liked it so much that I thought, uh, well, when I graduate, I think I'm going to do this for a full winter and nothing else. I just want to get away from everything. I, would, I just, I'm tired of school. I'm tired of the BS of being around a lot of people. I just want to move out somewhere. So I went to the Pitchfork Ranch. Okay. Yep. I was just going to ask you where, where, so if you don't, I don't know. I, I res- understand if you don't want to give like an, an a, a location for yeah. that, but is, is that in <clears throat> Texas? <clears throat> yeah, it's in Texas. It's, uh, it's in King, King, King and Dickens County. It's 167,000 acres. And that had, and you basically had exclusive access yes. to that. That yeah. was you. Co- well, that's nobody, crazy. Nobody else was trapping. Sure. Nobody yep. else was hunting. And, and was coyotes the only thing you were trapping at the time? Bobcats. Okay. And with your ge- geographical location, see, mm-hmm. for my mindset, being up north further, October, they're prime, they're furry, they're worth something. Yeah. We always make fun of the guys in Texas that we work with because they look yeah. like rats. We're like, you guys don't have fur down mm-hmm. there. But where yeah. you were... That's not the case. Well, you in and they would they would prime out in November. Okay, you did and not probably, sell anything in October. The further north you go, the better yeah. the fur is going to be. Oh, sure, but, but yeah, mean, yeah they cold, were st- just colder. Right. They were basically right. were still yeah. usable though. Yeah, I mean oh, you yeah. were still okay. getting. Yeah. yeah, I mean I'd gotten I got as much as a hundred bucks for a coyote. Oh, jeez. And uh, but that was in seventy seven. And you would you would you would skin them and everything, stretch them or no? Oh yeah, yep. Yeah, I'd, I'd go out. I, I moved into a half dugout with no running water, no electricity. And and the the manager of the ranch said, "There it is." So next to them was a fifty thousand acre ranch. So I got permission to trap there. And then there was a ten thousand acre, and I got there, and a forty thousand acre, and I got there, and another ten thousand acre, and I can nail that down. And I would see nobody for a week just until what, I went just in what to get you groceries. Wanted, right? <laughs> till you went to until get I groceries. Went, yeah. get, went in to get groceries. Forty five miles to get groceries. And then I'd go back out and stay for another week and go out and get groceries and come back out. How many traps do you think you would have set at one time? Uh, then, you know, 40 max. Okay. Uh, later, it got up to about 80. No snaring at all? No, I don't even know how to use a snare. Gotcha, gotcha. No, it's just steel traps. And yeah. and you were, you were, that's how, that was your livelihood at that, that was time. it. I've made, I paid my college loan off. Wow. Pick up. Yep. And bought groceries and had some beer money. How many? Wow. Uh, how many? How many furs do you think you did that that year? That, that winter? first winter, uh, uh, two hundred and five coyotes and thirty nine cats. I wish I would have known then what I know now. Yeah, yeah. I could have got yeah. a lot more. Yeah. So Every, everybody does, right? Exactly. Yeah. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah. The story of like what? So what was your what was your season? How many how many months were you at hammering doing? The uh, trap? I started November first and I quit March first. Okay. Yeah. And did you ever have issues? ever recall throughout your time doing it where you had to be honest a shit show where you had maybe some moisture and then freezing and all your oh, traps grief, were basically yes. oh that that was constant constant that was constant constant yes. okay where yeah. that that's that's where people don't understand like oh you just go set a trap it works yeah. for you 48 24 that's, hours you show up and there's a coyote in it when you when you run a productive line and you do it right which is tr- to check them every day. I don't like to leave animals in yep. traps. Yep. You check them every day. That is some of the toughest work because you're out in the in the in the snow, in the ice, the rain. You're out there all the time, and uh, and digging these holes, and you know, you tr- 
try to get in in time to skin your animals. And if you don't, or if it's too cold that night, you pull them into the dugout, build the, the uh, fireplace up, hang them up by a rafter and skin them right there where you eat lunch and breakfast. And dugout, you just just like a little uh, cabin type it's thing? A, it's a cabin. It's what I call a half dugout. It's window level with the ground. Okay. And it was built in 1948. And you've got it in this in the, in this book. I think so. I think yeah, there's I a think picture. I see yeah. the picture of it in there. I'm pretty I th- I sure. Think yeah, it is. I'm, I'm pretty sure. sure. Yeah. And and uh, what you did you did that trapping for about how long? Did you say where where it was like? I did like, it from seventy four uh, for a living seventy four to seventy nine. And were you doing your journal, <clears throat> taking notes at this time? Oh yeah, you were. You what bet. what was your best year? Productive wise, uh, three three hundred, maybe three hundred coyotes. Yeah. Uh, actually, my best cat, let's see, was in two thousand and seven. I caught a hundred and three cats in fifty nine oh days. My. And what were you average wise on a on a cat fur? That winter, the best I ever averaged was two sixty. Average. And, wow. Average so cat. you that's yeah that's a good. Yeah, I mean that's, that's a that's some <laughs> some. some Hard work, but but that's see when I go after cats, that's only for two months. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I so was that, wondering. I was so that hundred and three is over fifty nine days. Is that a lot because of a season or just the prime? That's prime. Yeah, okay, yeah, it didn't. You could go because we have a season. We have a season up here. No, we don't have a season. Okay. Wow. But yeah. but I I learned after I got into it because when I first went out to the. Uh, to the ranch and started trapping after post graduation. I really didn't know how to trap cats, and I just kind of gradually learned. <clears throat> but uh, they're just—they're so easy. They're—they're they're just a very easy animal to capture. What was the most? What was your highest value cat? Do you remember? Four hundred. Four hundred. Yeah. Yeah, that one year up here, man, we had. Yeah, I think I'd sold one for eight one time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, y'all got well, way better cats than we have. Yeah, some of them are ugly. Which, some of them are now they ain't worth shit. But yeah, it's kind of sad to see. But yeah. you'll trap here for 59 days and catch three. Yeah, if that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I think the best I did that one year was 11. Yeah. I caught nine in one night. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would take us all year to get something like that. <laughs> I think I've seen nine in my life. <laughs> and at the time of you trapping, you were still actively calling? Or did you yes, devote but, your time? Yes, but I, don't, I didn't like to call on the line. See, that's, you don't mix them. Okay. Because then you stir the animals up. Yeah. And so, you, so you, might, you might have a 50-mile trap line, but if you're going to call, you move off into another area and do your calling. And what, what you're saying by calling on the line, you don't want to call these animals, that, whether it be a cat or a, a coyote. That would possibly be trapped, right? Yeah, right. It, well, it, what it does, it just disrupts their yes. their routine. Yep. And yep. I didn't want to do that. And then it took it took about two weeks to trap out an area, and then I would have to move my lines to another region, to another area, on oh, that two okay. or three hundred thousand acres. And then I would, you know, trap there for two weeks, and then I'd shift to another area because eventually you trap an area down to where it's not, it's just not feasible. It's then just not profitable. Would you make a full circle in that time I did. or not? I, I would make a full circle uh, because gas. You know, I was two. I mean, I yep. was I was forty five yep. miles from home, and so uh, I would start out, and whenever I ended the day, uh, my last sets were close to the house yet on a, on another route, I was like a back route coming in. What would you say your trap line distance wise? Uh, those were about fifty miles. That's a trip. So would you yeah. skin every night then? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every night. Uh, what would you say as far as is the art of trapping dead nowadays? I think so. Uh, I tell you, I'm kind of an old fashioned, traditional type guy. I still use long, st- uh, long uh, spring traps. You know, like everybody now is going to these little jump trap type things. You know, which are good traps. Yeah. But I'm, I'm still. I like to shoot, uh, use. Uh, you know, new house traps, that's my favorite trap. And, the, God, those things, they started making those in 1849 and quit in 1978. Yeah. And uh, I, I still use some. If I'm on an area where there's going to be a lot of traffic, say on a ranch road where somebody might steal a trap, well, I won't put a new house, I'll put a victor. Okay. Uh, because, you know, victor, no big deal. Yeah. But yeah. a new house, that's a big deal. Yeah. What a... 
what do you, you, you said you're tr- kind of a tr- traditional, mm-hmm. you know, I would say that I, I can't say that we are, especially with all the shit sh- that's going on nowadays. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't, I, I have to be real careful with what I'm doing because I see a lot of stuff online that I just don't like. I, I don't, I try I to, would say we learn traditionally. Yeah, well, hundred percent. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I, I was, dude. I had the same thing. I had a Marlin thirty. That was the first thing that I shot with my grandpa. Open sight Marlin thirty thirty yeah, with a tally, yeah. old orange tally ho in a medicine capsule. Yeah, that's what we used, uh-huh. and grew from there. And like I told you, you know, n- n- not nothing really Which about the tally ho is an open recall. We went to uh, the electronic and i'm like gosh mm-hmm. man to me i i honestly probably went five years just going that's cheating that i'm not mm-hmm. going to use electronic mm-hmm. oh until we, we custom up and down people are ruining coyote calling with them and then yeah. now you see like i said guys got to be careful where i just I, I kind of distance myself from a, other than what i post like on social media mm-hmm. i try not to engage i try not to watch other people's stuff to an extent right. yeah unless i really uh understand and respect their view like like yours i would mm-hmm. I, I i that's that's awesome but you see a lot of people that are out there and i can't say that we aren't one of them mm-hmm. that w- want to have their stuff viewed it's all about mm-hmm. views but i mm-hmm. want to do it in a very professional manner i right. want to show something very tasteful yeah y- y- exactly what's your take on on the 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 trend on the hunting trend that's going nowadays brutally honest i don't like it i don't like it i, I think they they try to dramatize it, try to make themselves look like some kind of. I don't. I, I just don't really. I don't even watch coyote calling videos. I refuse it. I refuse and, it because you'll have some guys that sits down and cries, mm-hmm. which is I think is BS. And uh, and uh, that's just my opinion. Yep. yep. And yeah, these guys, you know, go up and do high five. You know, like for instance, I took some guys out from for a from a manufacturing company that does some. I just wanted to say the name, but it's big. And uh, <clears throat> they just tossed all the coyotes down the canyon. I said, hold it, guys. I said, we don't treat an animal like that. I said, I want you to go down and get every one of them, and let's put them where they would want to be right now if they were alive. And if it's a, if it's a warm day, they're going to be in the shadow of a tree. And I said, don't just throw them in a pile. Yep. Lay them out there respectfully. Yes, we did shoot them but respect them in death. And that's what I do. And that's what yeah. I've taught my yeah. boys. That's and definitely we're good. so similar. I mean, yeah. it, it, it we is. go out and shoot two, 300 coyotes a year. That ain't worth shit, but bring it, bring it home and, and hang it up and then sell it for five bucks. You know, mm-hmm. it's not something we just leave lay and yeah. go to waste. And, and a lot of people that's in, in the, this day and age, it's their, it's compartmentalization. They're freaking they're there. It's, there's a, there's a group here, there's a group here, there's a group here, there's a group mm-hmm. here, there's a group, and everybody's nitpicking each other, which is why I try to kind of just stay away from it because, you know, you... you. I'm just keeping it from vibrating on you, the table. You have people that are, like, that's kind of thus the question, like, seasonal, mm-hmm. if you were a seasonal hunter versus, uh, you know, a season, you know, a, a, a just all year round type of thing, mm-hmm. where you've kind of witnessed both Mm -hmm. where you trapped obviously Mm -hmm. you're not going to trap all year round because the value of the fur isn't there if you're doing it for a living Mm -hmm. you're going to want to sustain that and you're going to want to get the high value Mm -hmm. us out here like i can completely relate to that where we do the same thing we even though the fur is junk now we try Mm -hmm. to sell them and even if we don't sell them it's different because i value them with the camera Mm -hmm. there's a value and even if we do kill them or we don't most of the time we do we have value there because it's not just the fur, but we have them on video. Right. Now, right. My, my expression is that that coyote will essentially, it, it'll live forever on video, right. on, on, right. on picture. And then also from the perspective of like ranching, right? Mm-hmm. We background cattle, like similar to what your son does, where uh, we also uh, calve out a lot of cows, you mm-hmm. know, maybe not 600 head. Uh, we're out there all night and whether or not the coyote is actually going to do something, that's going to cause a death. We don't need the added stress to the cattle, so we're out there yeah. minimizing that that sure. that aspect, or you know, trying to kind of help the cattle out. So there's a couple different ways that we look at it, but you see a lot of people now that are just they're they're you know, oh, well, you guys only do it for this much. You're not a real hunter. You don't really. I'm like, no, nah, man, you got You got to you got to <laughs> kind of look at the big picture here. Yeah. 
Yeah. And with the technology, you've seen a lot of that. Same thing. You're just like, yeah. what the hell? Yeah. What what gets me? You see a lot of overnight pros pop up yeah. <laughs> because of the the electronic devices, yep. because of the the night scopes, and you know. Yeah. And and I, you know, and I just I just brush it off. It's no big deal because. I know. I mean, I've been at it 58 years, and um, and I don't have to get in an argument with somebody the way they do things. I may not agree with it, and I know that a lot of them are just overnight. You know, it's just an overnight deal, a one night stand, more or less, yeah. you can say. And I just let it, I just let things go it, off. And you back. see that you see yeah. that online. What, it's what just you, a sh- it's just a freaking war zone with different. This guy runs this from this company. This guy runs that from that company. This guy does it this way. This and I'm just yeah. like, I'm I'm not yeah. even looking at. No. It. I'm doing my no. own thing. I want. I don't want. I don't care. It's it's kind of a, you know, you might be kind of handicapping yourself by not seeing what's going on in in the world of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I honestly don't care as long as I'm doing my thing. Yeah. And, and I feel it's right. I'm doing it. I don't think it's in a handicap. I it's you know I I have a way. You have a way that's successful and I don't need to yeah. worry about what everybody else is doing. Yeah. yeah. Just because the way we do it doesn't mean yeah. that's, that's the right way or that's, right. that's the way everybody yeah. else. Is. Yeah. Over the past your your past, uh, you know, 40, 50 years that you've been doing it, you know, who, who are some of the companies that you've worked with? Who, who have you had, uh, you know, a, the fortunate or non-fortunate opportunity to work with throughout, you know, some of those endeavors, some of those experiences. Oh, I've, I've, I've had, uh, um, worked with Leopold Scope, great guys, wonderful guys to this day. You know, I love Leopold Scopes, and uh, and I've taken out the guys from Winchester, and they were they were good guys, nice guys. Uh, and then of course, I I took out uh, um, shit. Oh heck, uh, Donald Trump Jr. Call it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, you did. Yeah. Oh, how, yeah. how, how, what'd you think of, of that? What'd you think of that Hell guy? Hell of a shot. Hell of a shot. Good shot. Shoot fast. I mean, it, it, what, what you need to be if you're going to be a, a, a predator shooter with a rifle, you need to shoot fast. I don't know. One of my mentors was a guy named Tick Morehouse, of all things. His name was Francis, but he was six feet forward and weighed about 240. <laughs> World War II veteran, and but everybody called him Tick. But nobody called him Francis, but his mother. But he was that guy was one hell of a cow hunter and a caller. And he's the guy who really mentored me in the early years. And his sage advice in the very beginning, he said, You gotta shoot fast and you gotta shoot accurately. And I never forgot that. And he always shot, he shot a customized 25 alt six with a three by nine Bosch and Loam scope with a CPC crosshair. I'll never forget it. And uh, he and I, if we, I've shot seven barrels out of rifles in the years that I've hunted. I mean, shot them out, had to take them off and put another barrel on. And partly because of him, because if we had a bad day of calling, we'd just sit and just shoot rocks at different distances. He said, we need to shoot. What do you think that distance is? How, how high should I aim? You know, what, how should I elevate this? If you got a little wind, where should I aim? And we would shoot until the barrels were sizzling hot. And so it was. It was constant. But that's the kind of guy he was. A, a completely different genre than now, where you can you don't guess range. Like on our set, yeah. I've got range finding binoculars, and I've got yeah. everything pegged yeah. out before it even happens. Yeah. I've got notes here that gives. Uh, except I, I actually stopped putting them down. I, I have them down, but I haven't put them in the big book yet. Uh, of every. The distance of, of nearly all the coyotes I've wow. shot. Let, let's let's break into some of the. Yeah, it, I'm so wondering, so, okay. like how far, not farthest, we're, but averages. We're at we're at forty okay. we're at forty five minutes. So let's let's uh okay go into some of the things that you would like to talk about regarding your your your, your legit data that you've accumulated over okay. the years. Some something the information that you would like to present that you okay. think is is really not, not only just. That's also like I would say really valuable to us. Yeah. Something that we can. I mean, everything we're talking about here, we're we're learning from you. But you know, just I, I'm sure there's a ton okay. of awesome stuff. Okay. A lot of people are interested in guns. Uh, 
I use a 222 Magnum Ackley Improved, 221 Fireball. Those are my two favorites. 220 Swift Ackley Improved. Ooh. Uh, what, what what are you cranking on that? What, what's you know, your, what, I don't crank on it very, very much uh, because I already, the barrel's almost gone. Okay. And but I was, the, when I first started shooting, it was a custom gun um, on a bird's eye maple stock and a Mauser 98 action. And I used to shoot uh, 40 grain. Wow. Bullets at forty three seventy one. Oh, I was gonna see. I knew where you, that was you going when you said a forty grain bullet out of a two twenty. Well, I knew. I knew. Yeah, I was saying. I knew that was going when you Ackley that thing. Yeah, and well, but the Ackley. The reason I did that is because I don't like uh, flowing brass. Yep. It's yep. It, and, and you don't have to do as and much. The Swift yeah. is bad because it has yep. so much pressure. You yep. know, PSI. Yep. And so I just Ackleyized it. Gotcha. And now I don't have to trim the car the cases. Exactly. Don't yep. have to trim the inside of the of the mouth of the case. Yep, and I, sh- I shoot it at about thirty nine fifty, you know, about like that. That's With a fifty five grain. What, so what's your barrel length on those on your on your rifles at your average? That one's a twenty six. Okay, uh, so you're yeah you got yeah, a, yeah that one's a twenty six. Uh, the fireball is a twenty four. The two twenty two Magnum Ackley improved is a twenty six. Most of them are longer barrel guns. Okay, twenty four yeah. over twenty. I mean, yeah, yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, you're you're optimizing the velocity capabilities. Yes. You're you're yeah. squeezing all of that out. Uh, all right. Let's see here. So you're obviously reloading everything yourself. Oh then. yeah. So I you're you're mean. you're going you're basically going for the max point blank method where you hold on to however far out there. You you you're yes. not really worrying about a, a holding over other than maybe giving a little bit for wind with. Well, for for calling, all of the shots essentially are under a hundred yards. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's what you want. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me see here, just a second. Here. Got so many dead gun notes. Okay, here's something interesting. All right, this one's. Uh, these are the gr- the uh, yardages of shots as of 2017, starting from 1970. Okay, all shots from zero to 99 yards. Sample size, 882 codes. Wow. Say uh, that again real quick. So, or, Nope, you're, you're good. You're good. I can re-listen to it. Yeah, keep okay. going. All right, sample size, 882. Overall average distance, 52.3 yards. Minimum Jeez. distance, 18 inches. Uh, <laughs> wow. Average, Is that from <laughs> you or from the barrel? From the end of the barrel. <laughs> uh, wow. Jeez. <laughs> Average running shot, 57.2 yards. Uh, sample size of running shots, 104. Percentage running shots, 11.80. Uh, all shots from 100 to 199, 382 coyotes. Average, 137.5 yards. That's so awesome that you um, recorded that stuff. All shots from 200 to 299, 138 uh, animals with 231 yards. Uh, from 300 to 399 yards, 27, average 328.4 yards. All shots from 400 to 499 will average 438.9 yards. All shots from 500 to 599 average 527. All shots from 600 to 699 average 613.5. All shots from 800 to 899 yards was 857. How many? Two. One was 868 yards and one was 846 yards. It, it, what was your setup on that? Uh, that wasn't a call up. That was just an incidental kill. So what was your rifle configuration? 280 was one and a okay. 25 Gibbs was another. Okay, one. so you were do you weren't in the 224. You were Not having, you had a, it got I was you. humping it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What what about your your optic? Were you making adjustments? Did you have a reticle or no, you, no. you 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 were I doing just, some yes. yeah, everything holdover. 20 feet over at 800 yeah. yards. Yep. You know. Wow. Got a little wind from the south so I'll give you Maybe six inches. That's in freaking nose. cool, man. That's <laughs> I don't care who you are. That that that's. Do you have that anywhere in some of your books? Do you have any of that? Data? Not that. No. Do you not want to put it there? Or I'd you, rather not. Really? No. Really? No. Okay. I was gonna say, gosh, man, I know a lot of guys that would be really just. No. That's that's cool. Yeah. You, no, that's I'd, that's even cooler that you'd want to kind of just keep it. I, you it's know, just, it's just something for me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
There is nobody that has shit like that. No, that's not <laughs> no, joke. not no, no absolutely not a, not, not a chance. That is no. crazy. Uh, so okay. did you? What what was the book look? No, keep going. Just keep uh, how going. Many, keep how many going. how many keep rounds do you think that. you sh- like when you're shooting all the time? I'm sorry. How many how many rounds do you think you'd shoot a year? You know, I'd, I'd always take a hundred rounds when I was in the trapping cabin. I take five. Uh, I would take um, five thousand rounds of twenty two ammunition, and I would take a hundred rounds of two forty three. That was in, but that was just down there on the trap line. But that, uh, but I would shoot way beyond that. I mean, I'd shoot right. through the spring, shoot rocks. I, I right. never stopped shooting. Practice. I shot Practice. all the time. Yeah. I still shoot that, almost every day. That's what people. Yep. Do, that's yeah. what's even yeah. more yeah. hats off respect for whenever, that. Whenever you see me drive away from the house, I'll have a two fifty seven Roberts beside me with the uh, with the stock in the back seat of the pickup. And I've got a sandbag here, and it's there. And I have a, um, say a um, thirty thirty Marlin with with peep sights, or I'll have a twenty five twenty Winchester or a thirty two twenty Winchester made nineteen twenty six, and I will shoot those things. Or I'll I'll have two or three pistols. So what I'm, kind of a sand? Do you, is it just a homemade sandbag? Yeah, a British leg, Levi legs. Yep. With those yep. little little pebbles that you get on the highway. Yep. Find them where guys have. Yeah, they they didn't get them all. I'll yep. go out and just put some of that deal and fill it up. So, yeah, yeah. Good heavy bag. Yeah, I've got my pickups full of them. I don't know. I go, what can I do with all these things? <laughs> That's <Yeah>. awesome. <laughs> yep. Build a good shooting rest. That's yeah. fucking cool. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> yeah. But here's an example of the notes. Okay, this is. I have notes that if, that include calling and photography, and I have notes just taking the harvesting the animal. And so I've got date, the class, the area, the rifle, if he's running, standing, or walking. I've got <laughs> the distance. I've got the time, the wind, age, weight, gender, minutes answered, direction he call, came from, the wind direction also, temperature, and comments. And I take that on every one that I take. What, what's the class? What, you said class on the one? What was class that? class would be a bobcat or a coyote. Okay, yeah. okay. And then what was the last comment? Something comments. special about so, the situation. Yeah, it was like tripod good, good condition. Or, uh, yeah. Bad mange. Uh, gotcha. Excellent condition. Yeah. Shot up bad. Uh, bad with mange. Good condition. Uh, I really can't read that. What? And <laughs> speaking of that mange, I mean, you said you kept notes as yep. far as over the years, the mm-hmm. changes. Mm-hmm. Do you see a lot of mange down there or did you? Not anymore. Okay. Uh, back in 1999, I'd say almost 100% of the coyotes were mangy. Really? Yeah. It was such that you didn't even see coyotes anymore. Really? Yeah. They died from it. Yeah. I've so found, when I've, did you first start seeing the mange? 1985. Okay. Do you have any opinions? Do you have any opinions on any of that? Well, it came or from theories? Mexico. It might came from Mexico. It it jumped the it jumped the uh, the Rio Grande and came into into Texas and then just moved like a dust storm. Went north. Yep. And what's do you have any opinions on, uh, you know, like you said, that really bad year or bad couple of years mm-hmm. versus kind of it cleaning up and that's, going? Yeah, that's when it maxed out. That's when it it died out, basically, except for just incidentals. It, I mean, it kept it. It just became less frequent because my notes indicate as much. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and then finally, like last winter, I don't remember shooting any. Wow. With mange. Uh. Or even photographing it with me. Right. What, what is that the journal that you take with, or do you take a different journal and then I transfer take, I the... take a different journal and transfer it to this, okay. because on that yep. journal in the field, I also take a blood spot, a blood uh, fingerprint from every one that I take. For some day, be it now, be it 50 years, be it 100 years, someone can take a DNA sample and find out what animals were like back then. <laughs> What's the... For every what, one wow. of them. That's insane. I mean... Yeah, the value of that. Every one of them. Priceless. So, yeah. So the, the, literally, you, you did that so they they can the, what just the, the DNA so they can go back and evaluate the structure of right. what it was. I right. got you. Yep. Wow. If something has changed over the decades of yep. evolution, and how many years yeah. you been doing that? Oh, uh, probably. Gosh, I don't know. Maybe twenty years. Yeah, twenty five. Twenty yeah. years documenting every single. That's the. That's just the blood. Oh, okay. Okay. As so far as been, your notes, though, longer. You said yeah. Fifty eight years. 
Wow. Yeah, my notes. Yeah, here we go. Oh, oh there it is. That's wow. just wow. That's just from Bobcats. <laughs> is can, can when when we're done, can I get like a just for video, or do you not want sure. to be that no, show? I was just fine. gonna say because I could show the people that are yeah, looking. Sure. Since they're probably never gonna see sure. it. Yeah. Oh heck, no. No, yeah. absolutely not. I mean, that would be like that's, that's that's like the gold standard. That's different level. Yeah. Like yeah, no kidding. Of information Platinum standard. Screw so gold. It, ha, ha, are, have you go? No, go no, ahead. It gets old. Taking that many notes, it gets old at the end of the calling season because then I've got to go and do this this statistic, statistical analysis of all this stuff. Yeah, and that takes a couple of days, and it's just like oh. Shit. So do you transfer as soon as like like your hunting day? You say you take a different different journal into the field. No, you, I take the same same journal. But with just a, a different oh different, different page. For the, yeah okay and th- this is number so and so this oh, is okay. the date yep yep what, what's your what's your statistical analysis what what is that you you have to you have to like read what happened and then yeah you, I take you, the I take all the numbers okay say for instance okay okay this is a summation from uh, from 29th of August 2021 through March two of t- uh, 2022. Uh, average shot distance, 69.3 yards. Maximum distance, 202 yards. Minimum, 12 yards. Average response time, six and a half minutes. Uh, minimum, wow. maximum, 20 nice. minutes. Uh, minimum, five seconds. Average temperature, 54.7 degrees. Period of day that response was observed, 23 uh, in the morning and two in the afternoon. Number of stands where, where multiples were called in and harvested were two. Calibers and units and number of units taken with each. 16 with a 221 fireball, seven with the uh, uh, 22250 uh, Ackley Improved, and two with the 220 Swift Ackley Improved. General angle of approach, upwind five for 20%. Diagonal upwind, 36%. Downwind, zero. Diagonal downwind, 24%. Crosswind, 20%. Shot of moving targets, none. Average distance running, none. And what was that on? Oh, keep going. That's part of your analysis right yes. there. Percentage of one-shot kills, 84%. Uh, maximum age for season was 149 months. Minimum age for the season was 10 months. Average age for the entire season was 50.1 months with sample size of 23 coyotes. Eight juveniles harvested for 4%. Uh, Two bobcats were adults. I don't know. Okay, so oh. that was statistical analysis on about twenty, about about twenty five coyotes, yeah, roughly. Yeah, yeah. Over what period? It's how, just how? just uh one winter. Yeah, that one winter. Yeah. Wow. How are you aging them like that? You're, okay. You're when used- I when I was when I was engaged in research at Tech, and they obtained the uh, the grant to study and pay me to do it. They gave me a pamphlet, and it was I think from Kansas, that told how to approximately age coyotes by incisor wear. And so I studied that. And so I aged like 10 coyotes and then took their skulls and the professor sent them to this university and they looked and they said, your aging is close enough for, for scientific research. Wow. Yeah. So you're good. You, you should teach us. That. <laughs> you should teach us that before you go. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, yeah. so we shot that one coyote awesome. that hardly had any teeth. How old is he? Those, uh, <laughs> you know, every once in a while you get one like that. They're probably twelve to fifteen years old. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. What's the average life expectancy of a coyote? You know, probably determined. That, it it all say. depends on the cut, the country, or the area. if you're if you're calling in country that hasn't been called where the population is stable you're going to catch you're going to uh, ca- uh, you're going to harvest older animals they're going to be five seven eight years old i know one day in 1969 this rancher came up to me and i was ordering a pickup i was a senior at tech and and i, I wanted to by god get out of that bronco that had no windows <laughs> And there's a 1966 Bronco Roadster. They only made 5,000 of them, by the way. And that's a side note. You wish you still had it? Uh, I know where it is. <laughs> oh, really? Cleveland, Ohio. They bring it. They're fetching up over 100 grand now. Uh-huh. I gave $1,000 for it. Yeah. You wish you still had yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
But anyway, he came and said, hey, what have you been up to? And I said, oh, you know, a little coyote call. He said, why don't you come out to my place? I said, yeah, well, where is it? Uh, he said, oh, it's over on the Middle Fork. I said, how, many, how much you got, country you got? Got four sections. I went, okay, I might run out there. In four hours, I shot 10 coyotes, and they were all like 8 to 12 years old. Wow. What's yes. the oldest you've seen? About 15. Gosh, dang, that's a lot. So that's, what do you credit that situation to? Uh, there, no Stable. hunting. No, yeah. no hunting. Everything was old. I was calling up triples and getting all of them. I called them two stands. I got up triples and got all three of them, and they were all old coyotes. And I got up one. That cow was was over double digits in age. Do you think nowadays average age is still the same? I mean, are they younger coyotes? Do you, if they... it's a hard hunted area, yes, they're younger animals. Yeah. You're going to get mostly pups and two year olds. Right. Yeah. As far as now, is there more hunters now? Oh, as yeah. There was back then. It's a. Fa- I'll tell you what. I took a guy one time uh, from Winchester calling, and he he was so blown away. He said, you are on the cusp of something big. That's what he said. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, you have been doing something that's fixing to get real big. You've been doing it for decades that's fixing to get real big, and it did. Yeah. That was before it got real popular. Yeah. And he was just yeah. referring to coyote calling in general. Yep, just coyote calling. That's impressive, man. All of that stuff is just, that to me is Mind um, blowing. It's, it's uh, to to look back on it and to see. I mean, back in the like back in the eighties, uh, when I was really doing a lot of shooting a lot of coyotes back then, uh, it was. Uh, there's just been changes. What are let's do let's talk about that because okay. I've got another one written down here. What are some of the noticeable biggest other than because you mentioned the size? Yes changes that you've seen over the past the whole time you've been doing it okay in the 70s and 80s you would see a lot of coyotes crossing open country you don't anymore they've yeah. learned they've learned that if you cross open country you get shot yeah and when if you do see one he's hauling butt yeah is, i don't even shoot yeah. at him i don't i mean we, when I see a coyote, I know people who, you know, they'll stop and just, you know, every coyote stop and shoot at him. I won't do it. I'll go, I'll meet you someday. Yeah. yeah. Is it the same thing? We don't, that we country do, wise, yeah. is it changed at all? I mean, is there more farm ground or is it all? Uh, that's more wheat country. Okay. More wheat country where you can see them a long way. Like the, both these coyotes shot at over 800 yards where it was open wheat field. Okay. Yeah. That's the same thing we do. Yeah. We can, we could <laughs> kill so many coyotes from the yeah. window. Yeah. And yeah. we're just like, nope. Yeah. Nope. We're not doing it. That's yeah. not how if it ain't we, on so film, many, it well, we, happen. we drive down the road on Instagram and we'll show us a, a, a story of a stupid pup, you know, that he's yeah. in some tall cover and could shotgun him. And we have 50 guys on Instagram going, what, what the hell? What? I'm like, dude, where's that's the not kill how shot? We where's the, yeah, that's where, where, we, we're going to, we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to meet we always you say, fair. We always you know? say, how many coyotes could we kill a year if we yeah. didn't film or did, did what we did? Yeah. Which doesn't matter, but you know, it's, it's I'm going to meet you someday on, on your yeah, on, on yeah. your level. Exactly. Yep. yep. It's me and you. Yeah. And not me driving down the road and you just kind of looking at the pickup and all yep. of a sudden somebody pops you. Yep. And and you can relate to me on this. I get made fun of, but like when we go thermal, I start feeling bad mm-hmm. because it's not it's 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 not sportsman's like. Yeah. It's not sportsman like to 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 kill him at night with the thermal. Yeah. It's just you, you it's yeah. it's it's it, it's cheating. It's too it, easy. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it's it would, terrible. You can't I don't get away do from a thermal. I've never done it, but I would guess that's probably it's, true. It's yeah, terrible. You can't get away from a thermal. You, the yeah. only problem that you really have is your exposure to the cold on yeah. on, on yeah. cold nights. That's Absolutely. it. Absolutely. That's yeah. it. That's that's the only thing you really have to defeat. I mean, granted, coyotes are freaking, you know, they're a machine. You have yeah. to, to, but we set up bait piles and it's just game over for mm-hmm. them, you know, mm-hmm. and it's a bad deal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, most of the time, I'd like to say we're a little more strategic about it because we try to set them up around guys' place that don't want them there no matter what. Yeah, so either right. we do it or else they're going to call the state and then they're going to freaking sure. go. Blanket tra- kill. Trap line, fly. So I'd like to think we're leaving some of the ones that aren't a problem or ones right. that aren't there exactly. yet. Exactly. Yep. But that's probably wishful thinking to yeah. an extent, you know. Yeah. But yeah, same mindset. That's what, cool. what other changes have you noticed as far as? 
Uh, that's mainly the, the biggest thing to me, which is is the weight change because because that is one of those evolutionary processes that that sometimes takes thousands of years. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I could but see, see that. Yeah. But see, whenever I started noticing this, we started, I killed my first wild hog. And I don't even shoot them anymore unless I just like want to test a bullet. Say I've got my 45 coat. I go, I wonder what this bullet will do. And I'll see a bore and I'll boom, go out, cut him open, dig the bullet out and take it home. And so mm-hmm. most now I just watch them go, you know, I let the coyotes eat you. But, uh, but I saw my first wild hogs, 1977, November. I was running trap lines on, uh, on uh, Bird Creek where the last wolf was killed in our part of the country in like 1910. And uh, the old buffalo wolves. And so... Uh, I wonder... Yeah, okay, keep going. But, but anyway, so after the, the hogs started really... Uh, increasing in numbers, the population density became really high. That's whenever you start seeing the coyote number, the the weight start picking up, and also also is this new trend of helicopter hunting. Mm-hmm. There's there's lots of that stuff going on, just you know slaughtering with with a chopper, and boy, since then the coyote no, the the weights have really escalated. So yeah, that's what's do you, crazy. Do you notice that. it harder to call a coyote because of that also, or not so much? I mean, oh. if, if a coyote's not hungry type thing. Not really. Yeah. Not really. Yeah. I know, I know there's If you're ways. in a good area, yeah. you know they're yeah. easy to call in. Yeah. yeah. What is, have you ever messed around with GPS collaring coyotes? No. So from your expertise, what's a coyote's, what would you say down there, probably similar to up here, a, a, a coyote's range? Okay, I know exactly. Uh I did. Uh, it's part of my of research. Course you do. <laughs> part of my research in the seventies was the study of the the home range in the rolling plains of Texas. Which I mean, wouldn't you say that would transit translate to really close to what you're seeing out here or not? No, no. You're okay. going to have okay. wider ranging because you don't have the cover we do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So they're going to be widening. Uh, they're going to be ranging much further out, uh, nine square miles in our in our part of the state with that tight of cover. Nine square miles. So if just by but just by assessing from the air what you've seen and just mm-hmm. driving out here from the airport, mm-hmm. what would you oh, guess? I guess? I guess easily double that. Okay. Okay. Wow. We, I wouldn't and I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree, but we've seen some crazy ass yeah. stuff that see it changes from our our part of Texas to the Texas panhandle. See I do uh each year I call on a eighty thousand acre ranch right up in the northern part of the panhandle. And uh, and I take usually a magazine rider with me, and I'm telling you those cows range up there because it's it's country like this except probably a little more cover, but they have a lot of that old flat grass buffalo grass country. Yeah. And what's out there? Yep. They got to go somewhere to get something to eat. Cedar berries. Mm-hmm. They may have to travel five miles over to where there's a, a bunch of cedar berries growing in rough country to and get I, food. And James has said this all the time, but. I just want to kind of see what you think as far as your nine square miles or whatever for your for your home range. How many coyotes population wise is in there? Uh, in nineteen in seventy, it, it's ridiculous 19... to me that you instantly just have an answer for all <laughs> of awesome. these. That's freaking cool. <laughs> well, there was some research done, and in the rolling plains in the nineteen mid nineteen seventies, they said it's four coyotes per square mile. That was the population density in the rolling plains. That was in the 70s. Now, there wasn't as much food in the 70s. There's probably more now. So I do you think, think so. So you think it'd be a smaller population density up here because there's less cover? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think I so. I would 100% agree with that. Yeah. Definitely. What's your, disper- what's your opinion on dispersion? What like when the pups are booted or when they decide yeah, to leave? Yeah. If there's if there is pressure, the, if there's the no fall, pressure, they call it the fall shuffle. Okay. And uh, when <laughs> that's, yeah, that's good. That's a good one. That's a good one for yeah. And, yeah. and the pups will hang around those dens until you know like late August. They're just kind of hang around, even though the adults say, "Look, you're out of here," and they're within you know probably a quarter of a mile of the den, and then they start, start dispersing out. And but November is the month of the real fall shuffle. If the if the pups go into an area where there is an established population, 
they keep moving until they find a void and then they establish. But that's what's been found in research. How, uh, and that plays into why non pressured areas have higher pop higher aged uh, coyotes, yeah, older coyotes. Right. Yeah. Yep. I was going to ask you something about that. How, not, not how far they went, but okay. Well, how would you, how would you relate that to here? Same thing. What's that? The, the dispersion. Like, see, Pro, like, you know, fall shuffle, I'm sure is, it works probably a pretty close to the same anywhere. You just got, they got to go farther. What, what <clears throat> are, when are you seeing the pups being born down there? In May. Oh, it's same there. Yeah. 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 May. Yeah. Pre, and breeding is from, uh, it start, you, it's February. Fe, pretty much February. Pre January. It's, it's, yeah. That's the same. They, they start, yeah. they what start is that, pairing like 50, up. 56 days. Is that right? Yeah. Is, for the gestation. On what? On the, the gestation for, the, for them to when they're bred down, yeah, pups, 50, it's only six days or something like that. Yeah, it's uh, let's see, the breeding season ends, you know, late February, and then I start seeing pups. When I used to dig up dens and I'd ear tag these pups, and in like the first week in May, they'd be like a week old. Okay, so you used to let's go and talk about that then. Yeah, so you would ear take pups just for your own yeah. deal, or no, that's for research. Yeah. Okay. How did that pan out? What What are some of the statistics or information you found out about that? Uh, that would be really cool or abnormal yeah. or not or one. Okay, I tried. I tagged. I think I tagged 169 adult coyotes for a home range study, and then the pups. I can't remember. I've got it all written down in another book that I didn't bring. When you When you tagged them, were you how, how were you just a soft foothold? Is that what you would no, do? No, no, I'd catch them in a new house, 14s and 4s, but you check your traps every day. Uh-huh. And so most of them, whenever I recaptured or I shot one, and you'd see them come into a call and you'd see a tag in their ear, and you go, oh, i got to get him, you know. There's some info. And i go down there and shoot and go look, and they might have some hair turned yeah. white in that spot, but, but they're yeah. just – Nothing, yeah. Yeah. nothing. Most of the time. Sometimes I'd see one limping. But that's uh, generally if they were caught in a situation where they fought a lot and they and they actually hurt themselves. Most of the time they don't. They just sit there. They just yeah. okay. So what was some of the data that you've pulled from the tags that you would that's that's kind of unique? Uh, first off, they average about nine square miles. The furthest coyote went right at sixty miles. Oh my! So that's some yeah. There was you go. Was that a male or a female? Uh, I don't male, know. Huh? Government trapper sent me that. Okay. He caught my. He caught a coyote that yep. I tagged. Uh, caught another one that went uh, probably twenty five miles. Uh, somebody shot it. Sent me the tag. And these guys are these guys. They don't. They're not putting down genders or anything. Right. 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 Yeah. Got it. You're yeah. doing this. So, yeah. You know. Read where you're doing this. So here it is. Uh, and I've caught them. Actually, caught them, and it'd be raining. Take them three, four miles away and, and go to the barn and do all my tagging and weighing, throw them out the door and capture them again within 20 steps of where I called them the first time. Uh, that's cool. <laughs> that's really that cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's some of the stuff that we were just kind of interested about. Same wow. thing as the hard way of GPSing yeah, is what say, you're you doing. Yeah, you GPS them, uh, you just didn't use an electronic collar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. The traditional, that was that, back to that traditional thing. I've got let's let's talk about a little bit of your uh that's that's going is there anything you'd like to touch base on that like your notes and your in your journal that you can think of anything that might be I have something Did you just do the tagging one season then or No, I did it for several years. Okay. Yeah. Did for several years. Yeah. When I yeah. when I was trapping actually even up into the 2000s uh, when I was at, uh after just cats and coyotes were worth maybe fifteen bucks, and I'm not going to skin a coyote for fifteen bucks. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so I would just uh, take the coyote out and tag him, let him go. I wouldn't kill it. Yeah, because I was after one thing, and that was cats. And would so, you? Did you tag any of them then, or no? no. Yeah, I, I didn't want to grab a yeah, one of those yeah. buzz saws. Would you just do use a <laughs> use a like a catch pole for the coyotes? That, I'm sorry. Would, would you just use like a catch pole? Not a no. That's what I was thinking. Okay. A choke pull. I'm like, yeah. Hey, See, I have what you call a bonker stick, 
and it's a and it's a <laughs> knock you, them you, unconscious. You hit them <laughs> one inch. It's about one inch in diameter. You knew the right pressure. <laughs> and about twenty four inches long, and and so I would get up to the coyote, and some of them were very easy. Some of you didn't have to do it. Sometimes you just reach down and grab them by the neck, and they wouldn't even try to bite you. And you just step on the trap and dra- grab them by the mouth and pull them out, sit down on them, put a tag in their ear. <laughs> And then That's let them go. Legitimate right there. And then you get some of them that were tough son oh, of a buck. You ever got you ever got nailed by one? One time, one time I got nipped, and this was my fault. I caught one, and he had gone out into a, a riverbed, and the drag I, I drag everything uh, except it's a, if it's in wide open country, and the drag had pulled down, and the coyote couldn't go further because I I put it like a nine foot chain on it because I don't want to lose high dollar trap. And so I walked out there, and this coyote was a kind of a fighter. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to have to watch this one, you know, because he's got a lot of chain and I'm wide open here. And so he's sitting there snarling, you know, and kind of backing up. So I just, all I do is I just hit him like on the nose, not hard, because you'll kill one. Yeah. So you just sort of like punk like this, and it'll knock him out for about five seconds. No shit. And okay. then you get on him. <laughs> you okay. get on him right now. Because you you cannot you cannot wait, get on them, grab them by the behind the neck, grab them by the mouth, and you got them. And but I caught a couple one uh, on with this one. Well, I missed it. It jumped and I missed hitting it. Well, then I took another cut at it, and I just barely grazed it. Well, then that son of a gun backed off and got some slack, and jumped right from my face. I mean, that mouth wide open, come right at my face. And I sidestepped him like this. And when I did, he'd nip me right on the edge and put a blood blister on my hand. <laughs> but did not cut me. Yeah. Jesus. And then I put him down, boy. Yeah. And put a tag in his ear. <laughs> okay. I said, we're going to do this right now. And I gave him a good bop and got him down, put a tag in his ear. Oh, when you said put him down, I thought no, you I didn't put kill him. him down. No, <laughs> I didn't kill him. I no. think there's a, there might be one of them that you're. You have a coyote in. I do. In your, in your, I do. In your, yeah, I see yeah. that. And uh, is then, that what you were doing then? Is tagging? Is that? Yeah, I was tagging okay. that one. Yeah. And uh, I got a hold of several though that uh, big males. Usually, it's the tough ones are the big males, and they get tangled up in the mesquites or a juniper, and so you got to go in and get them. And so I'm crawling in the brush, and I mean he's sitting there. I mean just hitting the end of that chain and growling and, and snapping at me, and I mean mouth wide open. I'm going okay, okay. And and when I finally get him, and I got him by the mouth, then that son of a starts fighting me, and I'm caught up in all this brush, mm-hmm. and I'm trying to stand upright, and and he's pulling back. I got him between my legs, and he's pulling back and shaking his head and trying to pull out of my grip, and I go, if I let this son of a gun go, he's gonna eat me alive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I am gonna be. He's gonna tattoo me real good, and so I'm sitting there giving it all I got with my with my hand. And then I'm squeezing him with my knees until he finally, he lets up. And then then I go around and I, I wrap a string around his mouth where he can't open it, and then I'll take him out of the yeah. trap. Yeah. Wow. Gosh, that's a lot of work to do something like that. It is. That's yeah. a lot of work. Was that just, did you do it all, all by yourself? Was yeah. That, yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's even cooler. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're calling, do you ever have, does it? Always just you, or is I sometimes I take my brother sometimes, yep. most of it I, I just go by myself. Yep. Or if, if, say, for instance, magazine editors are coming out, and I'll take a, okay. a, a guy, yeah, and maybe the rancher's son, or right? Something like right. that, you know. So, what real quick, uh, what, what, uh, where do you? Pop them and knock them out right on right across the right nose, right on the nose, straight down, not into it, straight down between their nose and their eyes. And I, and I'm not talking about hitting them hard. I'm talking about just like, bam, like a that. good little just 40, a little flash. thirty pound snap, maybe little flash. Maybe 20. you'll kill, you'll kill one if you don't watch it. Okay. And a lot of times you'll give them a concussion. Yeah. Because one eye one eye is, is dilated and the other is not. Yeah. When you see. and and they'll just run in a circle. And uh, and you know you've you've kind of hurt them a little bit, but they'll get over it and they'll finally, you know, kick them and they'll <laughs> straighten out and then they'll take off. How how long are they usually out for on average? Like, does it daze them a couple seconds? You said. said five oh seconds. yeah, just just a few seconds. They're out. Long wow. enough to get your hands yeah. on him, huh? What what uh, 
is what are some of your most memorable, like you and I, when we were in touch, you, you sent mm-hmm. me, or when we've been in touch for quite a bit, but you sent me a couple of emails mm-hmm. with, uh, some double pistol kills and stuff. Yeah, I went through a period in the 80s where I, I wanted to just hunt with a pistol, and I, I used a centerfire, uh, generally a 41 Magnum, or I'd use a Ruger Mark II with, an eight, uh, with a 10-inch AMT barrel and a six-power Leopold scope. And, uh, and I'd call these coyotes up, and the longest shot was 100 yards. Uh, shot one that was uh, sitting looking at me, and I guessed him in 100, and I ticked it up and hit him right in the chest, and he ran maybe 30 yards and fell over. And I've shot doubles, uh, called two up at one time and shoot one other and run out there and stop and shoot him. And uh, um, But uh, it, it, I maybe shot 60, something like That's that. That's impressive with, yeah. with handguns. Yeah. Yeah. That's really impressive. Yeah. I don't yeah. know of anybody yeah. out there that has done that, even it's, close uh, to that. I don't anymore because, you know, it's just – Mostly, I shoot rocks. Practicing, yep. You know, just I, was, I, I carry a bucket, like a three-gallon bucket of rocks, about like this, and I'll stop and just pitch one out and just sit there and just empty it. Pop, 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 pop. Yeah, yeah. Clips on practice. It. Yeah. So on your when you're out now and you're mm-hmm. you're strictly going for photography, do mm-hmm. you carry a sidearm with you? No, you don't. You no. don't carry any kind of a firearm at no. all. Just no. your camera. Just a camera. So over the past years, what's the advancements that you've changed up and and utilized regarding the camera aspect? Well, in the early days, of course, you know, it was all manual focus, film, and that was the tough photography years. That was, that's what we were saying earlier. That sets the legitimate of compared to nowadays where shit's auto. It's just, man, that was, those were some really, really tough years of, of, for, for photography because trying to, to get, you know, moving coyotes with a manual focus coming at you ducking and dodging is just nearly impossible. And, uh, but the, when they introduced in autofocus, I mean, it was a whole new, whole new realm. It just made everything so easy. I mean, I've, I've got hundreds, thousands of coyote pictures and bobcat pictures that I would not have otherwise had if I was using just manual. And I, I don't have to use as, as a <clears throat> powerful a lens. I used to use, a 500 f4.5 Canon with a uh, f1n Canon f1n with a motor drive, and now I use a 1dx. Uh, and of course, the the f1n shot five frames a second. 1dx is 12, and I use a 100 to 400 millimeter. Which thank God they came out with a good one because I've had these cats come in so close that you have to zoom out to 100 millimeter to get them in the frame. Whereas used to, I used a straight focal length. And, and it, if they came in that close, you're screwed. You yeah. just got to, well, there he is. He's looking at me, and I, I can't get a photograph. The, so your, your, your camera of choice now is Canon? Canon, And yeah. Your, yeah. that 1 to 400, is, do you know the, the, that is that a Canon lens also? Yes, yes. Uh, so I have that, well, I have a 1 to, or I have a 100 to 400 also. But I was just, I understand, if, F4, is that what that is? That's F4 to 5.6. Yes. F4.5 to 5.6. F4.5. Yep. Yep. Same. same my, mm-hmm. my white, a white lens. White lens. Yes. Yeah, it's, a, it's an L lens. Yes. Low dispersion L. glass. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I, I use a R5. Okay. You're using the, uh, the, the new the digital stuff. The new digital. They did you away with the five. <clears throat> yeah. The Mark IV. The... I am not going to go that way. Okay. I have bought all the cameras I'm going to buy. I'm tired. Of, of you know because it's just another step up and another year there's another step up yep. you know another higher dollar camera yep. and I'm tired of it so I've got two uh, 5D uh, let's see there um, golly, I've got a five okay I've got a 5D Mark III 7D Mark II uh, 5D Mark II and then the 1DX and then I've got two that are five Ah, oh, they shoot. They're huge. They shoot like sixty or seventy uh, meg files, but they're real slow, like three frames a second max. But mostly that is on landscape. My wildlife combo is a one hundred to four hundred and the one DX. That's all I carry when I do coyote work. That's it. That's, that's it. your. That's, that's your lens. That's it. So have you seen those guys running that four hundred millimeter? That's like a two point eight, like a twelve thousand dollars. I've used a, a four hundred. 2.8, I've used an 800 F5.6, 
that weighs 14 pounds. No, you and just absolutely nope. have no use for it. Even the 400, that's a 2.8. No, you're like, they're too no. heavy. They're too big. See, I, I need mobility. Yeah. And uh, and I need to be able to you know to turn. I don't use a tripod. Everything's handheld. That's awesome. And so I just I have to maybe turn you know nine or 180 degrees. Sometimes even more than that. One's coming from the, uh, over behind me, and I have to turn. Well, you can't pick up a tripod and roll it around. So I wait until the coyote crosses behind a bush, and then I'll just suddenly I'm up into into place. Boom, just like that. Like with a rifle, you're sitting there like this. And all of a sudden, he's 50 yards out, and he's coming at you. You go, I can't move because he's got me spotted. He's got me located. But he goes behind that bush, and then you're like this. And when he comes out, you got him. Yep. Same wow. way with the camera. That's It'd cool. be nice to have some bushes around here. <laughs> we do the yeah. same thing, though. Yeah, as soon as they, you know, look. At, so what is your uh, – what, what do you shoot on? Are you manual? Is that what you do? Do you do uh, – uh, Okay. It's it's on autofocus. It's but, on autofocus. Yep, yep, okay, yep. I okay, yes. But it's on it's on it's on auto um, exposure, because okay, they you may do do coming, auto exposure. They may be coming out of the sun, and all of a sudden yeah. they swing around, and they and the perfect picture is like one second later, and he's over here. Well, I can't change that exposure. Yep, I got you. Makes so I sense. just put it on auto exposure. Okay. Yeah. What are you? So what are you trying to do with your aperture usually? Always open. All, as, as shallow depth of field as Always you can get. Open. Yep. Okay. And then yep. what what about your ISO? What are you seeing for your professionalism? Mostly uh, 200. Really? Mostly, well, I guess that's during the day. All that's 200. Cool. Always try to keep it about that low. You 200 and hardly ever over 400. So do you see that much noise when you get up to no. over four? What, so what? what how, no. You just, can start getting noise up in the thousands. But it's, it's just overexposing the picture. Or, I mean, what's the purpose of 200? You know, why? 200, just, it's. it's uh, your uh, resolution's better. If it's real good light, I'll shoot at 100 ISO. Okay. Yeah. I, okay. So you just you get a better image quality the lower mm-hmm. you're on that. Okay. Mm-hmm. I've went I've cranked my ISO quite a bit, but I was just curious as to if yeah. if you saw noise at that. My like, gosh, that's no. a low number. To, okay. And back in the film days, if you shot, you know, if you okay, they had Kodachrome 64 in my early years, Kodachrome 25 in the 70s, and I mean that was some tough stuff. I don't know what that is. Kodachrome 25, man, that's 25 ISO. Okay. And Watch so, the movie. There's a movie about it. Yeah. You know, Paul Simon, you know, Kodachrome, you know, yeah, he talks the, about Kodachrome. It's his favorite film. It's an all right color, movie. All the color. But anyway. I never heard uh, of that. It's on Netflix. The, the beauty or of was. digital is that I can start out with beautiful light at, at ISO 200, and, and I'm trying to shoot, you know, a thousandth of a second. Because more than likely it's going to be action. That's what I forgot to ask you. Your shutter speed is usually on I try average. To, I try to put it up, keep it up to about a thousand. Okay. But if the light starts getting really good, you can't help. You got to get down to about four hundredth of a second. And so you got to kind of, kind of got to watch. If they're coming at you real hard, you're probably going to miss them. You know, you just can't keep up with them. Yep. But uh, but if you're panning them, you can get them get them with that kind of speed. But if they're coming at you real hard and you're at a thousandth of a second, you're going to nail them. Gotcha. And so, uh, uh, you know, right at sunset, just as the sun's going down, when you got the ultimate light, the greatest light of all, that's when you're getting down real low. I'll, I'll crank it up to 400 ISO and uh, and try to keep it up to around 400 or 500 of a second. And, and you don't see any motion blur with that? <clears throat> Maybe a little bit? Sometimes if, if the coyote is coming at you, not jumping a lot, ducking and dodging, uh, you can you can get a, a every once in a while a pretty good picture. If he's ducking and dodging and giving it this, you know, it's a, it's going to be tough to get a sharp picture. What do you do after you have the photos? What do you do like for po- do you have like do some post editing to some of your you stuff? You have to with because all I shoot's raw. Yep. Yep. And uh, and your colors not your colors are slightly flat, so I'll go in and and pull my color up to where okay that was it that's yep. it. Or I'll look at it and I'll wait a minute. The sky's the sky's too blue. That's not right. So you're so matching. You're 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 not trying to over exaggerate no. anything. You're trying to match what it was. Yep. 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 Mm-hmm. So what do you use for that? Uh, Lightroom. Yep. Same thing. Yeah. Awesome. No, you don't mess around with Photoshop or anything like that. Really. I'm I'm sorry. I do I do, I do I do Photoshop, but I do Lightroom to edit. Yep. 
I don't even know how to do the do uh, work with my exposure in Lightroom. I, I had a guy try to show me, and I was so piss on it. it. I'm gonna go to Photoshop. I know how to work Photoshop. Oh, really? Yeah. So you don't you you do mess with your exposure and stuff in Photoshop. In Photoshop, but yeah. you change like maybe saturation or no, stuff. No, all I do is edit in Lightroom. Okay, gotcha. That's all. Just I just go down through there, just hit and delete, delete, delete. No, no, I'll keep that. Keep oh, that one. delete, oh, delete, delete, oh, delete, oh, delete. Okay, I I was like, what? Okay, makes yeah. sense. I got you. Just open up your file in Lightroom, and you just freaking go through them and delete, yeah, delete. I, you know, I see. Say for instance, uh, if I do a, a big shoot, like I was up on the uh, Diamond A uh, in Arizona, where I was, I was doing a shoot back in May, and uh, on advertising just for beef and stuff. And yeah, you know, I'd shoot three thousand photographs. Oh, you know, isn't that just a pain in the ass and to go through all of that? You have to just you just sit there and just tap 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 tap. Delete, delete, delete. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, no. How, how in the hell do you see in on a small thumbnail on your computer which you ones you want to keep? You full frame. Yeah, you're full. Yep. Big, yep. and you're looking at it. If it's not sharp, it's dead. How much work? If is it's just not that? sharp, it's gone. So those are easy. Bam, 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 bam. But if it's sharp, you know, and it's got a kind of a neat look, but it's not real great, but still there's a look there. I'll keep it because I want I want to keep I want to have some aspect that behavior of that animal it may not be the greatest shot but i don't want to throw it away unless it's not sharp if it's not sharp it's gone wow yeah that's that's something that a lot of people overlook too the amount of pictures that you take that you have to yeah. that you have to thumb through yeah it's just yeah. crazy it's i did crazy. i did a photo shoot for ford in 2015 on their um, uh, king ranch edition vehicles wow I don't know how many thousands of images over three days I shot. And luckily, they came out of Detroit. They shipped those vehicles down to the King Ranch. And they hired me to do the shoot. I shot thousands of images. And I was so happy when that, when that uh, design art director that was there with me, he said, do you want to go th through these or do you want me to? I said, I'll let you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's I'll awesome. let you. Oh wow! So did they end up using one a, a, one of your pictures? I'm sorry. Did they end up using one of your pictures? Oh, a bunch of them. for for like uh, bunch of them. what what were did they use oh, them through? My... They uh, they blew some of them up uh, as big as this whole wall right here for the uh, Houston livestock show. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Where's where's that King Ranch from you? It's about 500 miles south. Oh, that's south, a ways. South. Yeah. So what's your what's from all of your experience <clears throat> doing photography? I've had I have a, not a lot of guys, but I'll have a few guys throughout the year ask me, you know, hey man, I want to do this, I want to take some pictures, and I'm like, I don't have a ton of experience with a lot. Yeah. I've used the 5D Mark III, the 5D Mark IV, and now I'm in the R5. Yeah, use the Sony A7S III. I prefer the Canons, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm like, I don't. I, what What is just some of the things that you would tell somebody that wanted to get into photography to do? You know, just just some of your experience or. Uh, maybe even just what you've said about your lens, which you don't need to say 100 to 400. That's a huge, that, that speaks yeah. freaking leaps and bounds to me. That's like, all right, that's all I need. Yeah. That's what I'd probably do for elk too then, if that's yeah. the case. Yeah. I don't I, I get a lot of people will write or call me and, you know, what should I get, you know? And I'll just say, you know, get something affordable. You know, they're all good. All of them are good. And they, they'll tell me, they'll give me generally a price range, and I'll try to help them in that, keep everything within that price range. That's generally how I approach it. Yeah. Yeah. Within that, yeah, that's kind of a similar type of deal we do with guys with thermals. You know, what do you, what do you want? It depends on what your budget is. Yeah, yeah. What was, uh, what was the deal with the case of calls you had? Oh, the, the, the calls that I brought? Yeah. Yeah, th that's, that's my my sort of my top of the line that I, I've got like two or three cases of them, but that's the ones I... I so the, that's the case you brought to leave here for us? Uh, <laughs> do you, gonna, do you make them? show you. <laughs> you, you, build, you build them, you make them yourself? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've made them since I was uh, about 19. Oh, really? For, yeah. for a hobby or you sell them? Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. My wife, a few years ago, she came up and she said, uh, we, you know, you need to uh, sell some of those calls. And I said, I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Yeah, I know how that kind of stuff goes. I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to sit out there for six hours and work on a damn call, and get twenty bucks. She said, yeah. "No, that's not what I'm talking about." I said, "Well, what were you thinking?" I said, "We'll start at three hundred. I said, "You won't sell one." She sold ten thousand dollars in two weeks. Whoa. Oh. Okay, some you're of wrong. those women you're they wrong. know what they're She's talking right. about, huh? Yeah. Sometimes she's yeah. good at that. 
Wow. So do you, you, you make them on a, on a lathe or? No, no. I sit, hold them, and just sit there and turn them on a, on a, a sander. Okay, yeah. So you're. What, so, I'll, what I will do is like, for instance, my favorite thing is to, like mesquite, I'll go out to where they've, where they've done brush control and I will get the, the, uh, the root stock. It's, there's a ball. Yeah. It's like that's, yeah. that's, that's where the, um, what would you call it? The, uh, the real, uh, what is it? Uh, the marks of the mesquite. Um, the, the, gnarl, the, the, gnarl, the gnarly stuff is, yeah. you know, okay. it's real pretty. Yeah. And so I will take a chainsaw and I will cut it like into a loaf of bread about two inches thick. And then I'll get it on a uh, table saw, and I'll start sawing it into little like looks like bricks of chewing gum, like or TNT, yeah, yeah. yeah. something like that. Yeah, you know, yeah. yay long, I like this. And then I'll start with that, and then I'll just sit there and turn it with my hand till I make it round or whatever shape that I want it. And then I'll, I'll drill my hole if it's going to be an open, re- an enclosed reef, which those are easy. And those are the most ones that I sell. I hardly ever sell an opry because they're harder to blow. Yeah, yeah. And so I'll, I've got my drill bits, and I'll drill my holes, and then I'll form it out, and uh, and then I will uh, 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 put some uh, lemon oil on it, and then I'll buff it on a buffer. Yeah. And get it real shiny, and I'll put my initials in it. All right, and I'll do a coyote track on it. I'll draw a coyote track with a Dremel tool. And but now the tough ones are the open reef. Those are real tough because then I have to go to to a a um, a belt saw a uh, belt saw, and I have to cut down like this into the little stick, and then I have to go on to a uh, a round sander, and I'll have to create the curvature of the mouthpiece. That's everything. Yeah, that's absolutely everything to that sound. And and after a while, you kind of know. You look at it and you go. Okay, I'm I'm on it. This is going to work. Yeah, I may have to tweak it, but it's going to work. Some of them, I look at it and I go, maybe I can make this one work, and they uh-huh. they never work. Yeah. I just chunk them. But uh, but those are the tough ones. Yeah. So, so is, do, is there somewhere people can go and order them, or do you just kind of do it? Uh, oh, on my 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 website, which is wyomingmenser dot com. Okay. And the book also wyomingmenser dot com. Boom. Yeah. So what do you, what are... I did not realize that. Do you charge more for your awesome. open reads then since they're harder? Yes. To, okay. Yep. You got more time involved yep. on them. And they, and they just, they're just tough to make. Yeah. So which one? Yeah. And, they, and they're, and they're yeah. easy. Okay. The average person. Okay. Just figure the average person that goes into the field really doesn't know a whole lot. Yeah. Let's just face it. And for sure how to take care of a call. An open read call. You can throw an enclosed read up on your dash, you know, and let the dust get on it and then let the sun. But you throw an open read up on the dash and that read's gone. And so you got to really take care of them. You hang around your neck when you when you drop them down in your coat. You got to make sure they don't catch that read, mm-hmm. pop that read. And so I, uh, not many, I don't sell many of those. But I, I make them ba- basically out of juniper, uh, mesquite, uh, boat arc. If I go to South Texas, I will cut ebony wood. That is harder than boat arc. Do you see different sounds for the You different- know what? It is so hard. Hardly any of my calls sound alike. Nearly really? every one of them. I cannot yeah. make yeah. two just alike. Yeah. I've got one over there, a mesquite, that I have tried and tried to make another call that will imitate that one, and I cannot do it. And that's through dozens and dozens of calls, and I can't do it. But that call is absolutely fantastic. What's it take you to to, to run a call? What's it? I mean, what's it take you time wise from start to finish? Well, on an enclosed read, not that long. Yeah, I can do one in the morning. Oh, okay. Yeah, but these okay. open read calls, you know, it's going to take most of the day. So, do you just build? It? Do you have some inventory then for people that run? And then once I've got four or five up there, you know, that I've got. But most of the time, it may not be the right wood. They may be all mesquite. Well, they want juniper because it's okay. cheaper. Yeah, and they may want boat art because because it's between juniper and mesquite. And so, yeah. Okay. What? Let's do this. What? Walk us through us your set when you go out and and you're going into 
for people that might not have any idea or people that do have a ton of experience, how do you do it when you from start to finish? You're walking in, mm-hmm. you set up. Calling that, or taking a picture? Calling. I was going to say, first e- of all, e- either. E- either. The either, toughest right? is, is it different? photographing. The toughest. So By your set far would be the different toughest. as yeah. far as if you had a rifle yes. or, okay. A rifle, to me, you comparing, I mean, it's, a rifle is easy compared to getting a great photograph. Yep. Yeah. There's a I bang mean, switch. Easy. I mean, if I'm going to shoot with a rifle, I'm going to get on an elevated spot where I can see them for two, 300 yards. I got them spotted. I just set up and boom when they get there. Yeah. With, a, with a camera, I want them within from here to the corner of the room. Right. Coming at me. So basically your 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 maybe your sound sequences and everything is the same. It's just the layout of it's what the layout. you choose. It's yeah. the layout. So yes. take us through just the, the a hard one for your photography, which okay. would be a, a real elaborate rifle set. Okay. Um with a photography, <clears throat> I try to get in in grass that's not real tall, not tobosa grass, unless it's been it's been grazed down. I don't need any kind of structure in front of the animal if at all possible. <clears throat> I try to set at eye level. And so I back up into a bush, preferably a cedar, to where it's almost like its arms are around me. So I'm going to miss the guys coming in from the right or the left and behind me. But I'm focusing on that approach corridor from the front. So I'm very specific about choosing choosing the right approach corridor. I want that animal to come right out of that canyon or right out of that draw right there. Or if not, at least right over here to the side, but not over here where I can't see him. And so, <clears throat> those are very specific setups. I mean, those are those are hard to do. With a rifle, I always try to get up on a slightly elevated location to where I can get see at least a hundred yards, maybe two hundred, three hundred yards, and uh, and just get something behind me. I don't have to have the bushes surrounding me and hide me. I've even I don't even put camouflage on. <coughs> Excuse me. I wear uh, Filson, Filson uh, wool pants, and a Filson uh, hunting jacket. That's it. I don't wear. Uh, if I'm photographing, I will wear a face cover because your face is gonna they're gonna zero in on your face. But if I'm using a rifle, hell, I'll call like this. Mm. It's no big deal. What's your details on going in and, and calling? Like well, your 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 details on that. Like what? How do you yeah. how do you start off a set calling? Once uh, you once you've established <clears throat> the terrain features mm-hmm. that you've get, you got elevation for a, for a rifle or for mm-hmm. your photography. Mm-hmm. From then on, what do you do? I'll uh, do like maybe a maybe a ten second, uh, not a real high blast call, just kind of a low whimpering. And then generally within five minutes, uh, that's kind of a breaking point. Five minutes, uh, probably nothing's going to come because I ought to have a coyote by now. Off of one sequence, off of one. A lot of times I'll have one just stand up right in front of me, first sequence. Just stand up. Boop. So, so did see you. So you'll do basically a subtle distress. I, I do a subtle distress, and then I'll give it 30 seconds to a minute. Okay. And I'll give it another, another 15 seconds. 30 seconds to a minute and another one. Same v- volume? Same volume. Okay. Same volume. And, and you're thinking from your, from your data, you're, you, you're going to have something there within a minute to five minutes. Yep. Yep. Now, cats are going to take a little longer, but I don't target cats when okay. I'm calling. Okay. If a cat comes in, <clears throat> it's not because I specifically wanted that cat to come in. He just happened to be there. Yeah. We're the That's the reason way. nearly all of my cats come in under 10 minutes. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then, so then do you, once you hit, what, what time frame do you hit uh, before either one of two things? You change a sound up or mm-hmm. you're like, nothing's here, I'm leaving. 10 minutes. So 10 minutes max, you're out. Mm-hmm. You're done. You're wow. done if nothing pops so up. So you'd get up and walk off set. I get up. Yeah. But a lot of that has to play into, again, <clears throat> the population density down there is right. higher than up here. All right. So let's say right. Yours may be coming from a longer distance. Yep. You may have to sit longer. Yep. Let's say you knew there was coyotes there in the area. Would would you just change the sound after and stay longer in ten minutes or no? Uh, I'll sometimes mouse squeak. Okay. If I think if I have an inkling that something is there, I'll just start the little. Yeah. Before you go thing. into any kind of subtle with your call, you just start. With I'll that. do that sometimes, but I'll end it with that also. Just okay. in case there's a cat yep. 
hiding. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've seen that happen. I, one mm-hmm. time I had a bobcat. He was uh, from here to that table. And my wife saw him, and I couldn't see him. He's in, the, he's in this book, a picture of it. She said, there's a cat right here in front of you. I'm like, where? I was there near Breckenridge. And all of a sudden I look and I see one eye. And that cat is in this thick bush right in front of us. And all I can see is this one eye through this branch. And then I focus in. And I couldn't autofocus, so I had to manual mm-hmm. focus it on that one eye. Then I could see at one tooth he's kind of snarled just a little. And then he would his head down and his, his feet were out down in front of him like this. And when he left, he just backed up and disappeared instantly. And he was gone. Had she not seen that one eye, I'd have never known he was there. Mm. Wow. Yep. How many times has that happened? How many? There, yeah. That's true. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. I've, I've been calling before and stood up and turned around and be a cat sitting yep. right behind me. Yep. I go, whoa. Whoops. You know? Cats don't care so much about scent. Yeah. Right. More no, that, not at all. I've had them yeah. come up downwind. Yeah. Yep. No big deal. Yep. So between your 10 minute walk off and the time that you either start with a lip squeak or a real subtle distress or something, do you change the tone or the volume? Do you progressively get louder? Or do Not you... so much the volume. I might, I might do a, maybe some more coaxing. Okay, a little coaxing in there. What about throughout the different times of the year? Are you using a lot of distress, or do you get into vocals? Uh, February, I get into howling. That's what you primarily yeah. go yeah. to. I got a, I got a buffalo horn howler that I made that I've caught that I've called up a lot of cows with. <clears throat> and with the 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 areas that you hunt, do you, like where you're doing photos and stuff, mm-hmm. do you still have kind of basically an exclusive there for what you're doing, or not really? You know, they have opened that country up to uh, to deer hunting. You back in the early days, there was no deer hunting on any of those ranches, and everybody's got a fox pro. Yep, yep, yep. yeah. Everybody's yep. got a fox. Pro. Yep. It's completely and, changed. Uh, the, yep. The, I don't think I've met. One percent of deer hunters that aren't also coyote hunters. Yeah, they they see a coyote and they're shooting they, at it. They think they, they, think they exactly. Coyote hunters. exactly. <laughs> yeah, they think. So, yeah. until until you until you pay your your bills, pay for your pickup, pay for your college loan, yeah. your your yeah. food. That's when you know what coyote hunting is all about. Yeah. That's true. Yep, that's a good way to. Put that it. is another level that probably less than. One percent of the people ever know. Absolutely, less than one percent. Yes, hundred percent. Yeah, I don't know of anybody that did that. No, I was gonna say I'll never know no. it. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Like Dad, he when he was when they were young. You know, I remember when I was m- five years old when they were you know skin and stretching, making yeah. hundred two hundred dollars yeah. a pop from here. Yeah, but I mean that's supplemental income. Right. That's not his right. living. That, right. that wasn't. Yep. Yeah. That's a teacher salary on top of ranching. Right. So you, you can make it freaking nice yep. living. Yep. Doing exactly. that. Do you ever have uh, anybody say that because you're just shooting with the camera that you're calling them in like that, that you're making them call shy? Oh yeah. 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 You know, have people say, well, you're just making them. Wow. Well, yeah. So what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got my picture in their life. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, like I said, I you're not, another you're day. Not, if you're not good enough yeah. to call them in now, then yeah, exactly. So explain to us how you're, um, uh, I'm trying to think. The think of that. I got a question. How far are you walking from your pickup when you're setting up like that? It depends. Sometimes I walk a quarter of a mile. Sometimes, if in real rough country, I don't have to walk but maybe a hundred yards. Right. Really. Yep. Yeah. And, and like you said, you're you've there's brush, there's cover, there's mm-hmm. thick mm-hmm. where you could you we I don't think we could ever make no. a set and walk a hundred yards. No, you just get behind a. Like in, the, in that panhandle ranch I was telling you about, you just park behind a, a rolling hill yep. and then just ease up, or you drop down into a coulee. Yeah, yeah. And I remember one day I had uh, I had two uh, two guys with me. Uh, one of them was a magazine editor for Predator Nation. And, uh, and so there was this vast region below us of just open grassland. There was a herd of cattle down there. I knew there was a coyote down there. There had to be one. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So I said, guys, we cannot skylight ourselves. We've got to go down this coulee. So I took off, and back then I could run a little bit. I can't now with my knee. But we were just trotting down the dry coulee bed, down lower heads, below grass level. Uh-huh. And then when we got out to the opening mouth of the coulee, I set one over to the right, another kind of out in front. And me over here, because I didn't care if I shot him or not. I just one of these guys. I mean, within three minutes, boom. 
Yeah. There he was. On your sets that you're walking in 100 yards, will you get in there and set for a little while? Let it settle down? Or you... uh, uh, Yeah. Is that uh, it? Not a long time. Sure. Maybe a couple of minutes. Okay. Yeah. What's a coolie? A washout? A washout. Draw? A washout. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I assume. An arroyo. Yeah. yeah. I assume, but I'd never heard it called the coolie, so I yeah. wasn't sure. I think that's more of a Montana thing, probably. <laughs> we had a guy that came up here, oh, it's been 15 or 20 years, that had a show on the Sportsman Channel, Mossy Oak had a show, and it's the first time I ever did anything like it. And the only reason that I really did it was because the 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 videographer, the guy that's the cameraman for the mm-hmm. company, was is now a really good friend. He lives down in Texas, in Sherman, mm-hmm. Texas. Okay. I'm not sure if you know where that is or not. Oh, yeah. But um, we killed, like... 20 coyotes in two hours of film time we killed like a quint a quad a triple a double a couple bunch of singles all on mm-hmm. video and he had some terminology the guy from mossy oak you know he called all of our draws drainages and we were making fun of him you know just oh, yeah. the same yeah. thing but different yeah. yeah so what what how has your attitude changed uh over the past 30 years transitioning from actually killing them uh-huh. to filming more of them um uh, what, big Real big. Explain it. Go into detail well, on what you think about how uh, about all of a that. A reverence, a reverence for life. Yeah. You get that way when you get yeah. older. Yeah, I'm getting. I've you and I've talked. I've, I'm that way. Yeah. I'm already going there. Yeah. It's it's a reverence for, and I and I coyotes to me are not an enemy. I I love them. They represent uh, a wildness that once the wolf represented, although not as savage as the wolf was, and as dangerous on livestock. And I love to hear them howl. You know, they just, they are the epitome of, of wildness to me in, in just neat country. Big, wide open ranch country. I like it. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, you have to be 72 to, to think like this. You think that, that animal 10 minutes ago was out just trying to make a living. And then he heard me. And he came to me looking for something to eat to curb that hunger, and I killed it. Okay, I got his weight, I got his gender, got his age, got a blood print. But he was just trying to make a living like me and you. About like you and I, we're just trying to make it. And that's the way you start thinking after a while. And that's what's made me change. Yeah, I was going to say, is there any one specific thing that made you switch from a gun to a camera? Hmm. No, it's been gradual. Yeah. Real gradual. That's cool, though. And 100% respect that. Yeah, I mean, big time. Especially the legitimacy that you have from literally making a living on them to what you're doing now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's just a freaking awesome transition well, I'm and story. You, I'm glad you appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So do you still... Sh- Kill coyotes. Oh yeah, regularly. About you know, I may get 30, 35 a winter, but it's it's to keep my notes alive. Yeah. Because of one, I know I that once that. I I miss that year, there's a break in over forty years of notes. Yeah. yeah. That that has a lot of value. Not it I does. mean, you're, even though you're taking the lives of coyotes, mm-hmm. similar to what we're doing, we're taking them on the camera. I can always go back. My kids can always go and and look at how we did it, the hunt, mm-hmm. you know, what happened during that hunt. Mm-hmm. It was fun. We killed something, but there's something else there for people to preview. You right. know, we, we can explain it, and I don't know if you want to use the word justification. There's justification there with what you're doing in your journal because who knows what that's going to be in 100 years. And sure. your video, is sure. it's still data. It's not the hard data. It's not DNA like right. Wyman's right. getting, but your video of that coyote coming in, it's, it's still information one way or another. Yeah. And, yeah. and ultimately, my information is intended as the form of entertainment, mm-hmm. you know, right, where right. people are, I, I, I'm, I'm honestly, whether it's fur or not trying to capitalize on a situation where we would be doing it, whether or not we were filming or not, because sure. of the, yeah. because of the life, the, the lifestyle that we live with the livestock, mm-hmm. it's really easy for me to tell people that disagree with us. Hey man, shut up because you don't know the situation. Right. I have a neighbor over there. If we don't go in and we're not selective about what we do, Let's go in and kill them all. They'll call the state and the airplane. Yeah, so sure. why not us go in and help them sure. out when we're going to be doing it anyway? I understand. But, you know, how you said it, how you think about it, that's that's yeah. a uh, that's that's a lot of respect to the animal there without getting all yeah. fairy tale and, sure. you know. 
Well, in this book, and one of the reasons that I that I didn't go into killing in this book, uh, nowhere do I mention except whenever I kill my first one. Do I really mention much about killing? It's all about the art of calling. Yes. How to call, whether you want to photograph them, if you want to shoot them, that's your deal, uh, <clears throat> or just observe them. But it's just the art of calling predators. And, I mean, I could have put pictures in there of me with 50 coyotes hanging up behind me. I did, you know, yep. I, I, yeah. and you had turned so many people off. Yeah. I just wanted, I just wanted to explain that, that the art of calling is truly an art form that I found uh, that, uh, that one instance of where it was mentioned in 1854 when Marcy was doing the Red River Expedition and his Delaware Indian guide, as he put it, used a, a small instrument to imitate the bleat of a young antelope to call antelope into when, with rifle range so they could get larder for their, their, uh, their food. And they called in a darn mountain lion that almost got them. And so this stuff has been going on for centuries, if not eons. We don't know. Yeah. Thousands of you back to the Clovis men, we don't know. But calling's been around a long, long time. And this, I just wanted this book to be the art of calling an animal, not necessarily killing him. Yep. You can use it to kill, yep. but you can use it to photograph. You can yeah. use it to study their behavior. It's just about calling. Awesome. Do with it what you want. Do then results. What you, then that's results. Your what that's you, your deal after you get the yeah, book and look yeah. at it. Yep. Do what, do what okay. you want to do. I think that's cool. Yeah. I'll post it all on under this video. I'll post a link to that. Okay. To that. Thank you. To your where, where, wherever you can buy it. Yeah. WyomingMenzer.com. So, yep. I'll post a link to buy the book. And then um, the same thing we did on Predator Masters. Uh, how, how, many, how many predator hunting books have you done? Oh, this is first only one. Okay, somebody else on Predator Master said that they had another one of your books. It's I called can't... Coyote, and it's only a, it's just about the natural history of coyotes. I did that book in 1995. Okay. Yeah. And it's it's just basically about just not nothing to just do with about, hunting. This is a this is a history of biology got, mostly. I, biology, and I've got a picture of a of an Indian pictograph of a coyote and a jackrabbit. You know, dating back that the Indians reverence the reverence they had for the coyote. Wow, that was that would have been a really good one to end on the the the, the last five minutes of what you're saying, but um, what's what's your take on? I mean, we kind of got your opinion. What's your take on how things are 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 going in the industry? I know you said you didn't like it, you know. Uh, but okay, like I, I do not like predator contest. At okay. all, I do okay. not like predator. You, we're, we're 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 in. I'm yeah. in line with that. Yeah, weird. I'm, but without without me getting all freaking stoned to death over it. Yeah, uh, it's one of those things where, yeah, I I I I, I I'm just not going to disagree with you. Yeah, yeah I, I agree well, with that. But I, that's where I kind of keep myself distanced that, from. It is uh, <clears throat> number one. There's a lot of cheating going on. Absolutely. Yeah. When money's cheating, involved, that should happen. That's that's going to happen. Yeah, but hundred percent to me. People say, well, why don't you go and do a, a contest? I said, to me, it's between me and the coyote. Yeah. It's one-on-one, -on -one, like playing a game of basketball, one-on-one. -on -one. Who can get? Who can dribble better, good enough to get, get to the basket and make the goal? If a coyote's better than me, he's going to get away. If he's not better than me, I'll either shoot him or I'll get a good photograph. It's not about, oh, yeah, I, I killed 15 coyotes last night, you know, or, and 10 bobcats. I've done it. I don't know. I don't have to prove to anybody that I've done it. You know, I've, I've killed coyotes out to 600, 868 yards. I know I can. I know what I'm capable of doing. I don't have to prove it to anybody. But it's very, it's very personal to me calling coyotes. It's either I hunt them and I don't mix it. I either hunt to kill or I hunt to photograph, but I don't mix them. I used to a little bit. Trying to, I'd take a photograph and then I try to shoot them. I was Every once in a while, I'd do it. Okay. Every once in a while, I go, "Nah, I better keep, I better keep just one thing at a time." <laughs> and so, uh, but it's it's a very it's coyote calling to me is is a personal thing. It's not about you know showing somebody that I've called up you know thirty coyotes in a day. Like three years ago, I, I did in four hours. I called up thirty coyotes one morning on one big ranch, and it's 
I'm not, I don't tell people that except for you guys, you know, your fellow yeah. callers. Yeah. I don't go around uh, writing about or anything. It's just that it's just a personal thing. It's one on one. It's me and a coyote, him or me, whether it's for, uh, with a rifle or with a camera. And I'm not trying to trying to be a big shot. I'm not trying to tell somebody that I'm a big white hunter or a brown hunter or whatever color <laughs> you want to call it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. want to get out yeah, of yeah. that that level, <laughs> but uh, but it's just that uh, it's it's just um, I don't know. That's a good way to put it, though, because you know you there there's literally less than one percent of people that have actually s- sustained a living on 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 that animal. So you, yeah. you automatically have a completely different view. You automatically have yeah. a completely different yeah. respect when, when something is your livelihood, it's different. Yeah. It's different than that's really honestly how you said that, why we are try to, like I said, a couple times distance ourselves from a lot of people because it's just a, it, it, it's literally just a, a weekend hobby yeah. event, yeah. you know, like, like in without, getting you know in, into it but that's you know like like the contests yes it's it's a it's it's fun granted it's fun what we're doing yeah but there's a lot more to it yeah and the people the people that follow us are, are similar to the people that follow you respect it Good. they understand it Good. the people that don't it's go go whatever yeah. you know what what's your take on on the anti-hunting situation right now like how, how uh regarding well, i think that i think most of them are goofballs um mm-hmm. Because hunting is essential, you know it's it's essential because we don't we don't have a natural um, environment whether it's habitat whether it's pre- predator prey relationship it's in, it's out of balance anymore it's just it's the way man does things exactly I'm sorry yep that's how it is we screw things up yep and so you have to hunt uh, deer I'm not a big deer hunter only reason I kill a deer is for meat. I could if I didn't have to eat uh, venison because I've had a stint in 2016. My doctor said don't eat a bunch of beef. Uh, about every two weeks I'll eat beef. But other than that, all I eat is venison for mm. meat. Wow! If I didn't have to do that, I'd never kill a deer. Yep. Never yeah. kill a deer. Like you did in the what 70s, made a living off of trapping coyotes. Mm-hmm. Could you do that today with a camera? No. It's changed. Yeah. Everything has changed. Yeah. yeah. Even magazines, I'm telling exactly. you, the magazines exactly. have changed in the eighties. And I if if I'm going over time, just tell me. No, in the there 80s, is no time. It was almost like the Wild West for photographers. Yes. Yeah. Uh I mean I could call field and stream, sports of field, outdoor life, and say, Hey, I'm headed to Alaska. Would you buy me a plane ticket and you get the first shot at my images? They'd buy me a, pl- a plane ticket to Anchorage. And they'd get to see all my grizz pictures, all my elk, moose, I mean, my caribou, my moose. And, uh, and, and then all of a sudden, like in the 1990s, it just, uh, field and stream and outdoor life, outdoor, outdoor life I think, merged. Uh, sports of field went out. They went to the West Coast. And all of that changed. And, and I remember an editor called me, <clears throat> our director, and he said, here's what we're going to do. Because... There's about a half a dozen of you guys in America that really put out a lot of cover shots. We're going to pay you guys more than anybody else for a cover. Instead of getting a thousand bucks, we'll pay you eighteen to hundred dollars for a cover. And uh, that day, those days are gone. There's no way. So when you when they would say, for example, pay for your your room and board, your your mm-hmm. your ticket or whatever, in in exchange for that. Would you would they get exclusive rights to use mm-hmm. any photo that they wanted to that you took? Yeah, they they'd pay me for it. Okay, they yep. just want, yep. okay. they just wanted okay. to get yep. exclusive. So, so that, what that's doing yeah. is just giving them the first chance yeah. to look at yeah. yeah. shot. Okay, and if then, there was nothing. There was nothing. They're out. And right. And then what happened was digitization. Everything's oh. digital now, so yeah. there's no mag. Like yeah. when I was in high school, that's the first thing. That's all I would do. I'd go to the book rack and mm-hmm. I would read. Outdoor Life, Field mm-hmm. and Stream. Those would be the first two books I can mm-hmm. remember playing as day throughout all my any time in in high school or grade school yeah. that I had access. That yeah. would be I probably seen your stuff in there. Probably didn't even know stuff. it. Yeah. And now it's all it's all BS digital. It's yeah. you're on your phone. The photos. Yeah. It, it, it. I think it's really diluted the value of 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 what photography is. It, it has. It has. I tell you that to me the I loved really 
to be published in Sports of Field to me of the big three, they call them the big three in New York. Sports of Field was really the tops. Even though they didn't pay as much as maybe the other two guys, that was the most artsy magazine. And I liked my work being in a real magazine that that explored the artistic side. Exactly. And so yes. when Mam and I knocked the cover down on Sports of Field, I felt good. Awesome. Yeah, I've had like 50, 50 national covers on on those three magazines. Wow. Forty five or fifty of, over the years. Of everything. Everything. Moose, uh, Whitetail, Coyotes, um, you name it. Wow. That's so, a feat in itself, man. That's that's a that's a less than one. And I've yeah. got them all. Yeah. I have all those covers. Yeah. What are you doing with your with your pictures, your camera just nowadays? I shoot a lot of real estate. Okay. Yeah. But so, I still I still call coyotes and just take for pictures. your own. Oh man, I yourself. love. I'll never stop that. You'll do that forever. Oh, that's yeah. what I was gonna oh, say. Yeah. I love it. You, yeah, you. That's uh, for for anybody for everybody that's watching this that that follows all the way through to here. You guys have to. Uh, you sent me the link. The mm-hmm. Yeti did for you. Yes. So it's a. It's what is it? A two or three minute trailer. Seven minute. Well, seven minute. Seven minute. Seven. Well, it seems like two minutes because it's so well put together. Seven minutes. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome short story, it's short a, they document, call them short films. Yes, yeah. They yes. brought a, they they brought this huge crew in. It was like they shot for three days. Had three major cameras. I mean, <sighs> we're talking about the ones on your shoulder, yeah. Reds. Uh, yeah, yeah, big boys. And uh, they had a two video, uh, two drone uh, teams, and I don't know how many backup people that were sitting waiting for us to come out of the field. They had. Uh, table set up, computers, taking the the images, working them up. I mean, in the in the in the video, man, it was awesome. There's yeah. no telling how yeah. much they. You, is it a YouTube yeah. video or? Yeah, what? it's yeah. on yeah. YouTube, dude. It's it's 4K yeah. and it is. Is that it's just was that pretty recent? No, uh, no, it's 2016. Okay, but it's like I watched it and I'm yeah. like, absolutely. Yeah. If you that that's a awesome they did, piece. They did a tremendous job. Yeah, they did yeah. it. They they definitely did it justice to the storyline of what you're about yeah yeah I, I, I think they did and there and i'll tell you what the two boys uh that that own that or i think it went public but uh <clears throat> they are really cool dudes i've been to their ranch before the, the yeti guys yeah yeah uh they are they're they're nice guys and hunt oh my lord deer hunters oh my word they, they own ranch they own a ranch in kansas they own a ranch in uh, on the coast of Texas, they own seven or eight thousand acres down near Del Rio. I mean, those guys fish and hunt all the time. Do you still do stuff with them? Yeah. Are you affiliated yeah. with them, yeah. or are you oh, just yeah. friends? I'm, I'm kind of an ambassador. Cool. Yeah. So got, there is. Yeah. If I want to get, if I if they, they come up with something that's new, I'll go. Uh, yeah, we'll send it. Yeah, we'll send it to you. Awesome. So to kind of slope this off. Uh, you're recently <clears throat> got in. Is there anything that, I mean, gosh, we did some, uh, this has got to be one of the top. I, I always say it, but it keeps getting better and better, man. This is, this stuff here is hard to beat. Uh, a lot of people will appreciate it. So I got to get some pictures of your calls to overlay on the okay. video. I got to get some pictures of your journal. If you don't mind sure, your call overlay, that's fine. Uh, everybody that's listening to this needs to buy the art of predator calling uh, from Wyman Minzer. And it's to me, this is really you, you, you don't appreciate it unless you you're attempting to be a photographer like myself, mm-hmm. nothing on the level of you, obviously, but you look at the work that it takes to get the quality in the pictures that you've got here. And that makes the whole thing plus the information on the side. Awesome yeah. read. Well, thank so you. I appreciate the, it. The, absolutely. This is something that We'll just sit up here on the table and, and people enjoy looking through pictures. I've showed it to my kids and they're just, you know, in, in all over it. But from doing this book to what you're doing now, you just recently got into real estate. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh what what do you what what's your future like? You have already said you're gonna keep calling. Oh, you're yeah. gonna keep uh, photography, you're gonna yes. keep uh, maintaining your journal, which yes. is gonna involve hunting. Yes. What 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 what's your what's the your the rest of your of your uh in what you would like to see happen with the way things are going now for for yourself? Well, you know, as a real estate agent, I want to sell land, obviously. As a 
person who was raised on a ranch. My father was born in 1918. He worked old men born in the 1800s, and I I worked alongside them before they died. I really uh, respect ranches being held together. Unfortunately, they're being they're being uh, broken up and disseminated among the kids, and uh, I hate to see that, but. Uh, I'm a sorry ass real estate agent. I'll do it. Anyway, but no, no. It, uh, I um, one thing nice about it, I get to see a lot of neat country. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're that's. You, that's I I don't know for sure, but I can only imagine that's got to be a good um, gig for you right now in life. It is, it is, and my wife is is the biggest plus in it because I mean I I show the land. I being a uh, having a background in wildlife biology. Yes, I can talk the wildlife. I can yep. talk the grasses. I was yep. two years on the plant team at Tech. We won the nationals one year, and we blew it in Boise, Idaho, the second. Uh, I gave presentations at the International Meeting for the Society of Range Management in Tucson as a senior on my coyote research. Uh, so I can talk all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. She's the one that, that does, does the, all the paperwork. Yeah. So we're a good team. Yeah. You yeah. you solidify the sale. She just does all the BS <laughs> yeah. with the paper. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's cool, though. That's good. <laughs> that's oh, good for you on that. That's awesome. I, Are you just strictly in Texas then? Uh, she's getting hers in Oklahoma as well. Okay. So will you? Will you? You'll you'll work with her then, and oh, you'll travel uh, down. Uh, and... I'll, I can take photographs, but I can't discuss. Gotcha. Mm. That's gotcha. that's against the rules. Okay. So you're All strictly limited. Yeah. You're you're limited to, to to exposure in Texas. Yes, just Texas. Okay. Cool. Is there anything else that you can that I mean that you'd like to to tell guys? I don't know if you've even seen our work or 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 have seen what we do. But anything I have looked at your your Instagram, yes. Anything that you would like to explain, tell, talk um, to to guys that are listening to us for information or anything that you can think of. Just enjoy the sport. Just enjoy it. I mean, I have for fifty eight years. I've loved it since that first coyote I called in. I've been absolutely hooked, like the like the toughest drug that you'll ever get on. Yeah. And uh, and just uh, and be be fair to the animal, be fair to the animal. Don't don't go out and you know, and act like a jerk and shoot you know animals with underpowered guns if you're going to hunt. You know, be be fair with them and and uh, like like you don't go shoot an elk with a with a 22 magnum. Don't do that. Same thing with predators. They got a life. They got feelings. Which is why you don't go online. <laughs> Don't go there. Do, yeah, I hundred percent am in compliance with everything that you've said the whole time oh, you're here. You. So yes, thank you. Oh, I'm just trying to think, man. This was a good one. This was awesome. We're at, we're at two two. We still in two hours and about fifteen minutes, which is going to be wow, just awesome. Right. Yeah, and that doesn't include the hour beforehand. Yeah, <laughs> which is this is good. This is well, solid great. good info, and, and I appreciate. Uh, well, I'm honored to be here. I uh, really I appreciate it, you guys having me. We anytime. I wouldn't mind doing another one. So okay, that that's you bet. Yeah. Buy the book, guys. This I'll post this all over. Facebook and I will and, sign it to whomever. Okay. I will personalize every one of them. Okay. Okay. This that that that's the way they'll they'll contact you and they can just send yes. a message right on right, right right to your website. Right to my wife and she will come in there and put me to work. You want to leave that journal for a couple months? And- <laughs> 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 we'll I mean, fill in the you, you yeah. got a, you got something coming up. You can't go out, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh man, we might need that. Thank all. you. Yes. Appreciate it. Absolutely. James, very much, guys. Thank you, sir. Yes. You bet. That's an awesome one. That's an awesome one. That was good, guys. Yeah, we had, yeah, go for it, go for it. Heck yeah, we kept you for a long time. You know where it is. Your They're knee. neat. You're, you got, you got one more week, and you're, you're good. He's getting his knee. Okay. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. That was a good one. Uh, Wyman Minzer, and uh, that'll go down is probably one of the top ones that we've done. Be sure to check out the book. I'll have a link 
in the YouTube video. If I can post the link, which I think I might be able to do on uh, Spotify or Anchor. I'll do it. We're out, fellas. <laughs>